Hello and welcome to AmpFest. My name is Malte Ubo, and I'm a member of the AMP Technical Steering Committee. I'm also the lead for the team at Google that is working on AMP. Before kicking off the event, I want to acknowledge the times we're in. We're still in the middle of a global pandemic that has affected us all. And recently, we are once again witness to the events that show the systemic racism in our society that we must do everything in our power to eradicate. While this year has been difficult, it has shown us the true power of coming together as a community. I was disappointed when we had to postpone the MCONF in New York earlier this year. I was especially excited to return to the city where we hosted our first MCONF almost four years ago. But I'm super excited to open up our first ever official online gathering of the AMP community. Once it's safe to do so, we look forward to coming together again for AMPConf in the future. Today, you'll hear talks from all across the AMP ecosystem, including developers, publishers, agencies, email marketers, and much more. Whether you're watching from your bedroom or your office, I want to thank you so much for tuning in. And if you're watching our sessions as they premiere, be sure to hop into the YouTube live chat in this video if you have any comments or questions. We'll have AMP experts on standby ready to assist. Even without AmpConf, this year has been a major year of progress for the AMP project. Back in June, AMP officially graduated from the OpenJS Foundation Incubation Program to become an OpenJS growth project. I'd like to welcome Robin Ginn, Executive Director of the OpenJS Foundation, to say a few words about this exciting development. Thanks, Malta. And hey, friends, it's really great to join you all at the first ever AmpFest. I'm Robin Ginn, the Executive Director of the OpenJS Foundation. And as Malta mentioned, the AMP project recently graduated from the OpenJS Foundation Incubation Program to become a growth project. And uh, we're just really excited to welcome the AMP community into the OpenJS family. Uh, really, these communities to share uh, so many of the same values. The mission at the OpenJS Foundation is really to promote the adoption and continued development of key JavaScript technologies um, and, and related um, web technologies. And uh, AMP joins many other cool open source projects. Um, we have over 32 today. And uh, we really know that by working together um, in an independent and a neutral foundation, we can really just ensure the continued growth of these important technologies. But before I sign off, I just want to tell everyone that we hope that you will join us uh, tomorrow at an OpenJS Foundation Ask Me Anything. That's an AMA. It's tomorrow, 9 o'clock AM uh, Pacific time. And you can uh, ask a question. Um, through uh, the AMP or the OpenJS Foundation Twitter handle with hashtag AskAMP. Uh, and you can also tune into our YouTube channel at the OpenJS Foundation and ask uh, questions in the live chat. So hope to see you there tomorrow. Um, and again, welcome AMP community to OpenJS. Back to you, Malta. Thank you, Robin. We're excited to be part of the OpenJS family and can't wait to continue expanding our work within the foundation. We are also thrilled to welcome a new member to the AMP Technical Steering Committee, Kalsiana, a senior product manager at Axios. She led the development of Axios' AMP first website, which launched in February. Welcome, Kalsiana. I also have another exciting announcement about AMP's continued role in supporting web interoperability. The AMP project has already been working closely with Egalia to help advance predictability and interoperability among browsers. We are announcing a pledge to match up to $10,000 of donations to Egalia's Open Prioritization Initiative, which seeks to fund work on new feature implementations across various web browsers. You can learn more on Egalia's website or by checking out our announcement on the AMP blog. We love doing this work to improve the platform, and we're happy to be able to collaborate in ways that contribute to bettering the web comments for all of us. 2020 has been a year of major change for AMP. You may have seen Google Search announce an upcoming search ranking change this summer that incorporates new page experience metrics. These metrics include the Chrome team's core web vitals, along with a few other signals that paint a holistic picture of a user's experience on a page. As part of this update, Google also announced it will incorporate the page experience metrics into ranking criteria for top stories feature in search on mobile and remove the AMP requirement from top stories eligibility. In many ways, these changes are the result of a combination of five years of learnings from working on AMP. We know much of the AMP community has questions as to what this means for the future of AMP. And as, as you'll see across all of the talks today, the future of AMP is brighter than ever. I'd now like to invite my colleague, Joey Rozier, to share more on how AMP, the AMP team is working towards making AMP the well-led path to creating and maintaining great page experiences on the web. Thanks, Malta. 
Hello, everyone. My name is Joey Rozier, and I am the Operating Director of the AMP Technical Steering Committee. With the recent page experience announcements from Google, one of the number one questions we've gotten from the AMP community was how exactly AMP was performing against Core Web Vitals and page experience metrics. Today, I'm happy to share some data that shows how AMP already puts you on the path to achieving a great page experience. As you can see here, 60% of AMP domains pass Core Web Vitals metrics. That's compared to only 12% of non-AMP domains that pass Core Web Vitals metrics. This means there is a 5x chance that your domain's AMP pages pass CWV thresholds compared to non-AMP pages. We know there is still more work to be done to guarantee that all AMP domains achieve a great page experience, which is why we are working towards exactly that guarantee. Last month, we teased a new tool that we've been working on called Pixie. Pixie is a tool hosted on amp.dev that provides actionable feedback on how developers can improve the page experience of their AMP pages. This is especially relevant for pages being served on Origin, where developers can't benefit from an AMP cache. Stay tuned for a talk after this keynote from Ben Morse, as he'll walk you through how the team is working to provide a page experience guarantee for all AMP pages. On top of the great progress we've made this year with AMP and page experience, we are also making a ton of progress making AMP more flexible for developers. This gives developers the best of both worlds, the ability to optimize for page experience with the flexibility of ensuring that their business needs are met. We are doing so by investing in programs such as Bento AMP, which allows you to use AMP components outside of AMP pages. The team has made some exciting progress prototyping solutions for increasing flexibility for developers using AMP, and you'll get to hear more about this soon. With that, I'd like to hand the virtual stage back over to Malta. Thank you, everyone, for listening in. Thanks, Joey. It's great to see the amazing progress AMP is making towards guaranteeing a great page experience on websites. But as we all know, AMP does a lot more than provide a great page experience. AMP also powers beautiful content experiences like stories on the web and dynamic email. With stories, we've seen unbelievable progress throughout the last few months. It's been almost three years since we introduced the story format to the web, and we continue to see many publishers adopt the format to tell compelling, visually rich stories. In parallel, tooling support for stories has greatly expanded and improved, making story authoring available to everyone, especially those who want to create without needing to think about code. Given this expanding world of story creators and consumers, we started using the term web stories, since many of the folks creating stories don't need to interact with AMP at all, and instead they use hashtag no code tools to express themselves any way they want. Web stories live on the web and continue to allow publishers and creators to control their content, just like any other web page. As a format, web stories are also getting a few major upgrades. We're making stories richer and more interactive with a number of new features. We're adding support for interactive quizzes within stories to allow publishers and creators to engage with their audiences and build a sense of community. We're also integrating support for 360-degree videos and images within stories. This allows you to direct users to points of interest or they can explore a space on their own. We found that this fits amazingly well within the web stories format. While their 60 degree video might not be what you want for all your content, stories allow using it only when it makes sense. And then it can be absolutely magical. Now, with so many cool new features, you probably are going to want your stories featured across as many surfaces as possible. We fit your interest in deeply integrating web stories into your site experiences. And we're working on a rich open source story player to help you do exactly that. Be sure to tune into the talk later with Arun, where he'll walk you through more details on what's new with the web stories format. But right now, I'd like to invite Vamsi, a product manager at Google, to talk about the recent announcements regarding web stories. Thanks, Malta, and hello, everyone. My name is Vamsi Jasti. I'm a product manager on the team at Google that is bringing web stories to Google services. I'm super excited to be here and share the latest with you on how my team is thinking about the future of visual experiences across Google. You've probably seen the stories format in a number of different platforms. You just love them because they're visual first and bite-sized. But what's unique about web stories is that they live on the open web, just like a web page, and are entirely owned and controlled by you, including things like monetization and fine-grained analytics. We're thrilled for the wide audience of the web to have access to this visual content and format. Since web stories launched in 2018, we've seen millions of stories indexed from thousands of domains. And we continue to see amazing stories being produced by some of the top publishers and individual creators around the world. At last year's AmConf, we announced how Google was starting to display web stories in Google search results on mobile. Since then, 
You may have seen stories appearing even more in search, such as when stories show up in Blue Links, a visual stories block for certain search queries like things to do in New York, or other places when you type in a domain name. In addition to the placement and search results, we've recently been testing Web Stories and Discover, the feed that uses Google technology to bring users personalized content about their interests from across the web. Search is great for meeting users when they have a specific question or need. But with over 800 million monthly active users, Discover is a tremendous opportunity to push content to users that interest them and publishers are beginning to notice. There are many ways to access Discover. Some of the most common ways are the Android minus one screen or within the Google app on Android, similarly on the Google app on iOS, on google.com when you visit it from any browser on a mobile device, and finally, on the Chrome New Tab page. With Web Stories and Discover, we see an opportunity for publishers to serve a mobile-first audience and enjoy a new traffic source for their content. We wanted to give users a prominent and predictable place where they could consume the best stories from the web, personalized to their interests. This is why, a couple of weeks ago, we launched a new Web Stories carousel within Discover that allows users to easily browse and consume a number of stories with the all-popular tapping and swiping gestures that most story users are familiar with. We've been experimenting with this carousel since April, and we've learned a lot during this time. We've noticed that users love stories that have video, have a strong narrative voice that makes stories personal or relevant, and highlights unique aspects of the creator. Underneath the hood, they're just AMP pages, and a lot of what you already do can be transferred over. But there are also a variety of no-code tools being developed in the industry that can help you get started immediately. And finally, if you have a WordPress blog, it's easy to get started with WordPress Web Stories Editor. This is just the beginning, and we're looking forward to adding a ton more features and services where stories can show up across Search and Discover. To learn more about how Web Stories are showing up on Google, or to learn how you can get started making Web Stories today, visit our new site, stories.google, where you'll find all the information you need to get started. Thanks, Vamsi. I've especially enjoyed the new carousel experience in Discover. I need to personally admit to watching a lot of YouTube, like a lot, and I've never quite gotten lost in content like that on the web. Browsing the endless stream of stories in Discover was a game changer to me personally, and I truly believe they are a huge step forward to bringing creativity back in a way that has gotten lost in a bit since the early days of the web. Web stories are seeing a ton of momentum, and I can't wait to see the amazing experiences you all will create with the format. I now want to jump to our last topic in this talk, AMP for email. AMP for email has now been commercially available for more than a year and a half, and we are still constantly surprised at the new use case we see for dynamic email every day. I'd now like to hand it over to Crystal with some exciting news about support for the AMP for email format. Thanks, Malta, and hello, everyone. I'm Crystal Lambert, technically a writer, working for the web on the AMP project. As Malta said, AMP for email launched over a year ago at AMPConf Tokyo. At the time, AMP for email was only supported by Gmail and Mail.ru. But I'm excited to announce that Yahoo and AOL Mail have added their support for AMP for email. But that's not all. Salesforce will launch support to send AMP-powered emails within their marketing cloud early next year. You'll get to hear all about it from John later. But we are so thrilled to help bring dynamic email to millions of new users. The types of experiences our supporters bring to their customers has absolutely inspired and delighted us. We've seen a ton of success in audience engagement from businesses building interactive email experiences. A consumer credit company based out of Italy called Fine Domestic used AMP to create an in-email calculator. Users were able to get their financing rate directly in their inboxes. This boosted their email click rate by 133%. The e-commerce platform Equin, which services over 1 million small businesses around the world, used AMP to create a follow-up function. Merchants on their platform sent this email experience to customers who left items in their carts. After they started sending dynamic emails, Equin merchants saw up to an 82% boost in sales. Be sure to check out the sender success with AMP for email talk if you want to hear more awesome stories about how businesses are saving time, cutting costs, and creating marketing their customers like with AMP for email. With that, I'd like to thank all of you so much for listening, and I'll send it back over to Malta. Thanks, Crystal. It's great to see support for AMP for email expanding on new email clients. As technology, email has barely evolved since it was first introduced. With AMP for email, I'm constantly blown away by the new use cases I'm seeing email senders take advantage of. For websites, AMP is only getting better every day. We're working to guarantee a great page experience for every AMP page, aligning with Google's new page experience signals. 
We're also making AMP more flexible so that more developers and site owners can take advantage of the productivity and cost-saving benefits of AMP. We call that AMP as a service. For stories, AMP is the underlying technology bringing tons of new interactive functionality like quizzes and 360 video, but web stories are still only just getting started. It's never been easier to create a story and share it online. And with web stories and Google, users can easily find your content and cross the surfaces they already look for answers and entertainment. With email, more senders and email clients are launching support for AMP for email to bring dynamic inbox experiences to the users. We're seeing a ton of success from senders using AMP for email, not just for marketing, but also for increased productivity. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in to our first ever AmpFest. That was just the keynote. There's a whole lineup of talks scheduled after this that will take deep dives into everything we talked about. I hope you're all as excited for the rest of the event as I am and look forward to chatting with you all in our live chat room. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Ben Morse. I'm a developer advocate for the AMP project. My job is to help make it easier to make great websites for everyone. Today, let's talk about how AMP can guide you down the road to a great page experience. We'll talk about using AMP in a way people don't always consider to make better web pages for users. Shocking, right? But people often say they use AMP to get better SEO. Now, Google Search has announced they're in the process of making two changes that will change this conversation. First, although AMP is not a ranking factor in Google Search, soon something called page experience will be. Second, right now the top stories carousel is reserved for valid AMP pages, but soon the AMP requirement will be removed. Instead, the top stories carousel will be open to any page, but page experience will be a ranking factor. So what is this page experience thing? Let's talk about that. But before we do, I want to just note that over in AMP land, we're pretty excited about these upcoming changes in Google search because AMP was created to make it easier for everyone to make fast, stable sites for all users. Finally, AMP will be just that, a nice option to make great web pages. AMP was made to create excellent user experiences. Page experience is a set of criteria that measure great user experiences. That's why we think AMP is a fine way to start you down the road to page experience. Let's see why. When we say page experience, what do we mean? At the center of page experience is a concept called Core Web Vitals. Core Web Vitals is simply three metrics measured from real-world user data drawn from the Chrome User Experience Report. There's largest contentful paint to measure how quickly content appears on the screen. There is first input delay for the time between when elements display and when they're ready for user interactions. Finally, there's cumulative layout shift which measures how much page elements move around during page load, potentially distracting the user. Let's look at each of these in detail. First, largest contentful paint. This is a new and straightforward way of measuring page speed, how long it takes for content to load and display. Of course, there's lots of ways to measure speed. First, contentful paint is a popular metric, and largest contentful paint builds on its success. Speed index is a personal favorite, but it's pretty hard to explain. LCP is simple. How long does the largest element in the viewport take to appear? This element could be a hero image, a block of text, or something else. It's when users will perceive that a large and meaningful part of the page has appeared. Ideally, this will appear within two and a half seconds. Then there's first input delay, which measures how long a page takes to become responsive. It's not related to load time. It's the time between when a user first interacts with the page and when the browser responds. This reaction time can be slowed by long JavaScript tasks. And yet, you don't want your user to tap your menu button and then wait for it to open. First input delay should be less than 100 milliseconds. Finally, cumulative layout shift. This metric is newer. It's annoying when you're loading up a web page and you start reading something, and then suddenly that thing moves to make room for an image that's just loaded. Or even worse, a video ad. CLS measures how much elements move as the page displays. It multiplies the size of each element that moves, which how far it moves, and it adds that up. Below 0.1 is considered good. To meet a Core Web Vitals goal, you want to pass it for at least 75% of your page loads. For more details about each metric and the science behind them, visit web.dev. There's a link for each on your screen. 
Remember, if you're a news publisher, page experience will be a ranking factor in the top stories carousel. More importantly though, a recent study showed that when a site meets Core Web Vitals goals, users are 24% less likely to abandon page loads. So how does the web do in these metrics? How do AMP web pages fare? To find out, we check the Chrome user experience report. And at the time I'm giving this talk, 12% of non-AMP domains pass Core Web Vitals. For AMP domains, the figure was 60%. So AMP domains were five times more likely to pass than non-AMP. Why does AMP fare so much better? Well, just think about each metric. For largest contentful paint, valid AMP pages are built to have less JavaScript and less CSS. This helps content load quickly. For CSS, AMP enforces a 75K limit. For JavaScript, you'll have the AMP runtime, a small file for each component, and sometimes a little custom JavaScript all loaded asynchronously. Plus, AMP caches are quick, and they preload and pre-render content when possible. Soon we'll discuss how you can do much of what AMP caches do on your own server. For first input delay, well, less JavaScript means very little time between elements displaying and becoming interactive. It also helps that all JavaScript is loaded asynchronously. AMP can lazy load elements below the fold, so things you can't see yet won't delay things you can. And finally, AMP implements process chunking, so long tasks get split up and don't lock up your page. For cumulative layout shift, AMP's layout system involves declaring the size of every element in advance so that when things load, they just pop into their spaces without making their neighbors move. Plus, AMP tends to require a user interaction before you can change what's on the page. So of course you can meet Core Web Vitals thresholds without using AMP, but AMP can make it much easier. Okay, now that we have defined Core Web Vitals, we can define page experience. Page experience is simply Core Web Vitals plus a set of existing Google search signals. Let's go through those. Safe browsing. Google search defines this as a site that doesn't contain malicious or deceptive content like malware. With valid AMP, it's easy to notice if someone hacks your server and injects JavaScript onto your pages since that would break validation. Mobile friendliness. Making a responsive site that's natural on mobile devices always takes some work, but AMP is here to help. Every AMP component is responsive, and AMP's layout system helps you make any element responsive. HTTPS. AMP can't buy you an SSL certificate, but valid AMP does require HTTPS for just about everything. Again, AMP offers to guide you along the path. Intrusive interstitials. AMP strongly encourages you not to block your content with pop-ups or full-page takeovers, and it disallows intrusive ads. AMP is trying to help. I said before that 60% of AMP domains pass Core Web Vitals. So what about the other 40%? What if you're using AMP and you aren't passing? The metric where AMP pages most commonly have trouble is largest contentful paint. Fundamentally, how quickly your page loads and displays content. Since AMP caches already do a lot to speed up web pages, we'll focus primarily on what you can do to improve speed on your origin. If your AMP page isn't fast enough, what do you do? First, as with any web page, you want to make sure you optimize your images, CSS, and JavaScript. Here's how. Just like any web page, AMP pages can suffer from too many large images. Compressing images and making sure images are sized appropriately for each device is as important as ever. Google's AMP cache will optimize your images when possible, but you can make them smaller yourself. Try a tool like squish.app. On your own server, you can always install page speed modules, which will perform the same image optimizations as Google's AMP cache. If your page is valid AMP, you're already following guidelines that ensure you have less CSS and less JavaScript than most web pages. Even though the JavaScript most AMP components use is pretty tiny, you can minimize that by making sure you don't use too many AMP components on a given page, or load up JavaScript for components you're not using. Google Chrome's code coverage tool shows that most pages use little of their CSS. Use this to find unused CSS and eliminate it. And try to include on each page only the CSS that page uses instead of using the same CSS bundle site-wide. Of course, you should also be minifying your CSS. There's a lot more you can do. You can add a service worker. You should optimize your fonts. Check the link on your screen for a detailed guide. 
But let's focus now on what you can do specifically for AMP pages. This tool is indispensable for speeding up AMP pages on your origin, the AMP optimizer. It performs some of the same transformations as an AMP cache, and it adds a few of its own. For example, in most cases, the optimizer can server-side render AMP layouts. By server-side render, I mean it will calculate AMP layouts like responsive or fixed height, apply the proper classes and inline styles, and serve that with your HTML. Why does that matter? Well, AMP comes with boilerplate CSS that hides your page until the AMP runtime loads and does this work. If it's all done server-side instead, the boilerplate can be removed, letting your content be shown immediately. Here's how that looks for a sample image. The optimizer calculates its layout, then it decorates the AMP image tag with the appropriate classes and the AMP sizer tag. Generally, we want to let AMP decide when to load images. But when your page has a hero image, a substantial image above the fold, we want to show that as soon as possible. Not only is this good for the user, but it directly speeds up largest contentful paint time. The AMP optimizer detects this hero image on your page, or you can use the data hero attribute to specify it explicitly. Then, if possible, the optimizer will not only calculate the layout and decorate the AMP image tag, it will also add an image tag as a child of the AMP image, so the browser can load the hero image before the AMP runtime even starts up. To make the image load even sooner, it adds a link rel equals preload tag to ask the browser to preload the image. The AMP optimizer can also minify your HTML and CSS and do so much more. It can make your site load twice as fast on your origin. If you're serving AMP pages from your own domain, you need to try this. Finally, I'm excited to introduce to you a new tool called Pixie, the AMP page experience guide. Give Pixie the URL of your AMP web page and it will test it against page experience criteria, give you results, and tell you how you can improve your scores. Here's how it works. Pixie sends your URL to the PageSpeed Insights API to test Core Web Vitals. It runs the Search Console API to check mobile friendliness. And it runs the Safe Browsing API to make sure your URL hasn't gotten on Google's list of unsafe web pages to ensure you haven't been hacked. Then you can check your performance on Core Web Vitals, field data from the Chrome User Experience Report, and lab data from tests just done. You see the results for other page experience criteria. And then you get suggestions for how you can improve. Are you using an AMP optimizer? Are you preloading the AMP runtime? Are you server-side rendering and preloading your hero image? That's Pixie. Give it a try. In this new and flexible world of AMP, there are a few ways that AMP can help guide you down the road to page experience. First, when you can, make valid AMP pages. AMP will make sure you stay on the page experience track. Besides, valid AMP pages still get found and served by AMP caches like Google's, which gives you a speed boost that's hard to match. For simpler pages, or for pages users get to from search, this approach is highly recommended. Or maybe you want to mostly build your site with AMP, but you can't follow all its rules. Maybe you just need the extra bit of JavaScript or that analytics package that doesn't support AMP. Well, that's fine too. Create invalid AMP pages. Your page won't get into AMP caches, but AMP can still help you meet your page experience and Core Web Vitals goals. Or maybe you've already got non-AMP web pages, you're having trouble meeting Web Vitals thresholds, but you don't want to adopt a new framework. In that case, you'll like Bento AMP. What's Bento AMP? The team is rewriting each AMP component so it can work without the AMP runtime. Soon, you'll be able to use any AMP component on non-AMP web pages. So you can try AMP in your existing pages, gradually replacing slower, heavier JavaScript with lightweight AMP components. What if you're using WordPress? The official AMP WordPress plugin smooths the way toward converting your WordPress site or certain pages on your site to AMP. That's it. If you're already using AMP, I hope I've given you some ways to help you pass Core Web Vitals and page experience criteria. If you're not using AMP, I hope you've now got a way to gently let AMP into your life so AMP can guide you and your users down the road to page experience. Thanks a lot. Hi, folks. Thank you for joining us for AMP Fest so far. I hope you're excited about everything that you've been learning about what the AMP team has been up to for the past year. Now, I want to start off by thanking the team that's been working so hard to get this virtual conference together. 
My name is Nana Raisinghani, and I'm a product manager on the AMP project. My main focus is helping developers be more productive when they choose AMP. Now it's 2020, but it's still a great time of uncertainty. And regardless of where you are, one thing remains constant. And that is the fact that investing in the web is critical to a business's success now more than ever. The web has been around for ages. However, even in 2020, developers are still finding web development difficult. And in fact, in late 2019, when Mozilla Developer Network conducted a survey to understand common web developer pain points, the issue spanned the entire development process, from writing code that was secure and accessible to browser interoperability. And helping developers address common web development pain points in a user-first manner is actually right there in AMP's vision and mission. So given all of this, what has the AMP team been up to in 2020? Well, we first unveiled our vision of AMP as a service on a spring morning in Tokyo at AMPConf 2019. And we talked about how engineering teams could accelerate their workflow by using AMP. So what has changed since then? And what does the future of AMP actually look like? That's what this talk is all about, in fact. AMP as a service is our focus on making AMP the easiest way for developers to create and then maintain high quality web experiences without actually being burdened by issues such as performance or infrastructure. AMP's evergreen release schedule also means that these AMP experiences once created improve over time by becoming faster and more delightful without AMP developers having to invest any additional engineering resources. But what does this actually mean in reality? Well, when you build a website with AMP, you get a pit crew of engineers working behind the scenes to maintain your site's performance and improve your user's experience. And as the web evolves, so does your site, which means that every week your site gets an automatic tune-up that improves its actual performance, its accessibility, and it also offers you cool upgrades such as image optimization, modern JavaScript, etc. And all of this happens for free. And so what has AMP actually been doing to help out developers? Well, the first area that we have invested in make is making sure that AMP pages do well on the metrics that are measured by Core Web Vitals and the upcoming Google Page Experience Ranking Signal. Now, the most obvious step we have taken is continuing investing in AMP's performance. This means that the AMP runtime and AMP's components are improving all the time. And some recent improvements you may have received are preloaded hero images and only serving modern JavaScript that your user's browser needs in order to serve the particular AMP page. Now, for those who are getting AMP visits on origin, because they're investing in AMP first potentially, we have your back as well. Not only are these cache improvements available on the AMP optimizer, but the AMP optimizer is actually available in more places, such as 11T or Netlify. And if you want to learn more about the AMP optimizer, you can go to amp.dev slash amp optimizer. Now, like any other successful framework, we feel it's important to help developers debug AMP performance issues when they arise. And this is why we launched a diagnostic tool that helps developers debug why their AMP page may not be performing well on page experience. Now, this was a very quick summary, but if you want to learn more about this topic, you can actually listen to Ben speak about AMP and page experience. And speaking of performance, we also want to help developers make sure that their AMP pages are monetizing well. And this is why we released AMP Next Page, a component that helps publishers turn any AMP page into a continuous scrolling experience it does so by loading additional recommended content from the publisher's website when the user reaches the end of a document. Now, this component was intended to help publishers increase engagement on AMP pages by actually increasing the time that the user spent on the site. And we're excited to share that this is already being used by publishers such as Forbes. Now, the screen grab you can see now on the screen is that of Forbes live infinite scroll experience that's actually being powered by AMP Next Page. Now, we're also delighted to give advertisers and publishers more opportunities to monetize on AMP and have started working with Cargo to do just that. Cargo is a mobile-first advertising company that creates innovative campaigns for over 200 of the world's best-known brands. Now, we've started this relationship by actually adding support for Cargo's Sidekick unit, which you can actually see on the screen right now. Now, this partnership gives advertisers the ability to use Cargo's unique ad units on all of AMP's inventory. 
And this partnership is actually in response to requests from advertisers and publishers who actually wanted to increase media buying opportunities and creative ad executions on AMP. And speaking of units, let's actually talk about AMP components. Now, when a developer uses an AMP component, they're guaranteed that the components are written with users in mind. They're using components that are grounded in user research and that are tested for accessibility to make sure that all users are having a great experience. And to learn more about accessibility, you can actually watch Caroline's talk about accessibility in AMP. Now, one of the most onerous tasks in the software development cycle is actually maintaining infrastructure. A recurring request that we've received from developer teams has been to have an AMP release channel with longer intervals, which allows for a longer QA cycle. The long-term stable or the LTS release channel actually solves for this problem by only being released monthly. Now, we also received feedback that the 50 KB CSS limit that AMP enforced was way too small. And the intention of the CSS limit was to actually promote CSS hygiene, but we got feedback that the limit was still too tight. And so we worked with the AMP community to understand what a reasonable CSS limit could look like. And after working with plugin developers, news publishers, e-commerce site creators, et cetera, we realized that the most interactive experiences could actually fit in within 75 kilobytes of CSS. So that's what we made the new CSS limit. But we also want to provide developers with the tools to easily meet the CSS limit. And that's something that we've now started working on. But the optimizer can already help you here by doing things like removing white space. Now using AMP also means that you get an infrastructure team for free one whose job it is to make sure that your pages are actually performing well across all browsers with large market shares. Now, these are all just some immediate term improvements that the AMP team has made or is actually considering. And with that, thank you for joining me to learn about what our focus is in 2020 and beyond, the AMP as a service program. Our focus on making sure that AMP is the easiest way for developers to create and then maintain high quality web experiences. And now more than ever, we want developers to know that we've really got their back. And that's why we're investing our time to make them more productive and make them more efficient. Now, this is just how the AMP team has been thinking about 2020. We have a lot more in store for you for 2021 and beyond. And to hear me speak about that, please watch the What's Next in AMP video. Now, let us know if you have any questions. I am NanaR92 on Twitter if you want to chat. And our GitHub project is always open to those looking to leave some feedback. With that, I hope you enjoy the rest of the content that we have prepared for you. Remember to stay safe, wear a mask, social distance, and wash your hands. Thank you. And thank you for joining me in this conversation about accessibility and AMP as part of AMPFest. My name is Caroline Liu, and I am a software engineer at Google and contributor to the AMP project. To kick things off, I wanted to share a grueling accessibility statistic with you to ground us in why we invest in accessibility work in the first place. The folks over at the Web Accessibility in Mind organization conduct an annual million pages project. This is an effort that performs an accessibility analysis on the top 1 million home pages on the web. In 2019, they found that over 98% of home pages do not meet standard accessibility with respect to the web content accessibility guidelines. And let me be clear, these are only the automatically detectable errors that align with WCAG conformance failures. And those only constitute a small portion of all possible failures. As a result, a and AA conformance levels are likely to be much lower than even reported here, 98%. And the other statistic I wanted to share is 100% of users benefit from accessible, usable content. A 2016 study on web accessibility guidelines found that for all users, WCAG compliant websites results in faster task completion time, higher task completion rate, higher ratings in usability, trust, positive sentiment, and aesthetics, and lower ratings in cognitive workloads. So it didn't take so much energy to engage with the website in the first place. 
If you're new to the field, you might naturally think of accessibility engineering work as catering to users with disabilities. But it's important to acknowledge that we all benefit from accessibility features. For example, accessibility also benefits people using devices with distinct interaction patterns. Yes, that includes mobile phones compared to typical desktop experiences, but that also includes more atypical devices like smartwatches, smart TVs, anything else with a small screen or a different mode for taking user input. Secondly, again wanted to reiterate stepping away from the mental model that accessibility is only relevant to users with permanent disabilities. And while it's important to be inclusive of the 20% of folks who self-report as having a disability, it helps to also consider those who have temporary disabilities, such as a broken arm, lost glasses, or are otherwise occupied. I'm sure I'm not the only one who's tried to look up the route to a destination while I was driving, and in that moment, I want desperately for a safer alternative than the standard input pattern on mobile phones. Finally, accessibility features also benefit users in challenging situations like bright sunlight or noisy environments where audio can't be heard, or those with slow internet connection, limited or expensive bandwidth. So the key takeaway here is that designing with accessibility in mind helps everyone, not just those who need it. So what do all these facts mean when thinking about accessibility on the web platform? From the 2019 MDM Web Developer Needs Assessment Report, the accessibility findings were as follows, and I quote, developers described it as difficult and frustrating. Developers understand the steps to follow to make a site accessible, but sometimes those steps are hard to get right and the standards leave a lot to be desired. Often, a developer might be in a situation where their organization does not prioritize accessibility because perhaps it hasn't come up as an issue yet. I'm going to read a few developer testimonies from the report to drive home how difficult it is to get accessibility right on the web. One developer said, I don't think most web developers, myself included, put enough effort to make our apps accessible because it's hard. Another said, I do recognize how important it is, but it's just not something that's heavily invested upon. And this last one, the level of frustration that accessibility generates is greater than its level of importance, and it is important. These developer pain points are what the AMP as a Service initiative is talking about. Accessibility is hard, developers don't or can't invest as much as they should or want to, and AMP is uniquely positioned to take this burden off of them. This is why we here at the AMP Project believe AMP should empower you to build accessible pages by default. But even more, AMP should make it hard to build inaccessible pages by accident. This is what we do for the web format today. There's an engineering investment in focus management. Historically, publishers using AMP ecosystem tools have not been able to do this on their own as granularly as AMP can under the hood. One example of where we support this directly is with the AMP sidebar component. The extension will programmatically look for a close button to focus on and otherwise creates one that is explicitly accessible to screen readers if one's not available. So when the end user goes to open the modal, focus is immediately brought to the pre-existing or auto-generated close button to notify the end user that they are inside a new modal and context. AMP also enforces accessibility hierarchies. We enforce these through the code we write, through runtime warnings, and warnings in the AMP validator. We use these tools to have some level of opinion on ARIA and role attributes, DOM structures, and encourage using proper semantic HTML wherever possible. You'll see this when running markup through our AMP validator. For example, if a publisher places a click handler on a div element, which does not have any semantic meaning, validator errors will surface saying that we also need a role attribute so that end users may be notified of the purpose of an interaction and a tab index attribute so that the element can be focused on and interacted with at all. This gives both meaning and usability to interactive components. Finally, we also add accessibility attributes silently for consistent modal components. 
The third principle we follow is that visuals should not be the only way end users can extract information from a web page. And likewise, the mouse should not be the only way end users can interact with a web page. One example is the AMP selector component, which supports multiple modes of interactions that the publisher can specify. That means the options can be selected by using different keyboard select mode features on the component, allowing end users to navigate and select from options. Shifting more to process-based principles, AMP has historically listened intently to our champions of accessibility. I'll be the first to say accessibility engineering on AMP is piecemeal and varies from engineer to engineer. Luckily, we've always had someone at the table who voices these priorities and we always respond accordingly. Of course, this is short from the ideal because this begs the question of what if we didn't have that person? Still, our founding vision was to do right by the end user, and this is organically going to include accessibility. I'd also like to call out our experienced and vocal leadership on the AMP Advisory Committee who guide us in accessibility efforts at a higher level. So thanks to many of these folks, we've always had reasonable accessibility considerations front of mind in design discussions, which goes a long way. This brings me to my next point. We require accessibility in the process. To share a quick anecdote, when I first joined the team, I was designing and building a new AMP autocomplete component for our library. I'll be honest, up to this point, I had never worked on web accessibility features before. I had never even used a screen reader before. But as part of our component launch process, we required an accessibility audit on the new feature. Now, this isn't just a checkbox, it was actually quite involved. I documented critical primary and secondary user flows and high level steps to accomplish them. For example, one of the most critical pieces for an autocomplete user flow is to be able to type into the input and receive suggestions. And I broke this down into steps. The end user should be able to focus on the field, type from the keyboard, and receive dynamic options that match the partial initial input as well as change on continued input. Other critical end user journeys include navigating between suggestions and selecting from suggestions. And just by saying these examples, it can become clear how the process of designing features to be accessible really produces well-honed features in and of themselves. I'd also like to note as part of this process, every single accessibility bug that surfaced as a result of the audit had to be addressed as a prerequisite to launch. Baking it into the process at the product level not only guaranteed that I designed this component with accessibility in mind, but also required me to gain experience with web accessibility that I've carried forward into new projects. In other words, including accessibility as a process requirement directly leads to more accessible features, but also indirectly leads to engineers who are better trained in web accessibility. Folks who might not know or even care to know the right accessibility considerations suddenly become folks who do. And finally, and this is the most critical part, we have to document all the accessibility tools available to developers using AMP, and we have to document within reason whatever else we cannot do for them. How far does this component or this framework get you? How can you get yourself the rest of the way? So these are our tools for up-leveling your accessibility strategy when you choose AMP. And notably, these make sense for any document in the web format. You may be thinking, AMP has a bunch of other formats. How much can the web strategy apply to completely different ecosystems like ads, emails, and stories? I'd like to share with you this diagram I call the accessibility hierarchy of formats. So, those same six principles I've outlined here really became the foundation of this hierarchy. No matter what format you are in, our engineering chops still apply. We want to make sure the user focus flow is rock solid, the DOM has meaning baked into its structure and organization, and a variety of inputs are explicitly supported. All the process principles apply too. Listen to engineers who have been there, make it a process for those of us that haven't, and document the rest. Now let's talk about what an AMP ad is. It's essentially an entire AMP page in and of itself with some ad-specific runtime restrictions neatly packaged inside an iframe that lives in a whole other document. So all the principles on the web still apply. 
And the end user needs to be able to know when they are in the ad and when they're not. That is the essential difference. So going back to the hierarchy of formats, it would be reasonable to treat ads as having these two additional considerations on top of everything else we do in a regular AMP document on the web. Now let's talk about email. Suspending the content differential between them, an email is kind of like an ad in that the user is dealing with multiple contexts. They are either inside the email, engaging with the content of that isolated item, or they're outside the email in the larger email client, maybe managing their inbox, marking things unread, etc. Here, the same considerations for the web apply. That email document better be accessible in isolation. And then the considerations for AMP ads also apply. You should not only be able to go into an email and out of an email to your larger inbox, it should also be obvious which context you're in and when you have transitioned between them. The other important thing about emails is that they are displayed in a much larger complicated context that AMP has no control over. This is the email client, which could in itself support many interaction features like keyboard shortcuts to help with productivity. This is why it's crucial that what happens in the email stays in the email. That same keyboard navigation mode with an AMP selector in your email better not also make its way into the larger client. Otherwise, users end up leaking or duplicating interactions, and it becomes extremely messy. So back to the hierarchy. You could say that the accessibility principles for emails only build upon principles for ads, which in turn only build upon principles for websites. Finally, let's talk about web stories. They are such a complicated format, but in their essence, they are a group of smaller page-like units that are managed by a larger navigational interface, supporting tappable interactions, for example. If you squint a little, it kind of sounds like the last format we were talking about. We want the user to engage with the page unit that they're on, and they should also know when they're engaging with the story as a whole. For example, navigating between pages or muting or sharing content. The difference between this and an ad or an email, which also involve documents within larger contexts, is that for stories, AMP also has influence over the larger context that the document exists in. In that regard, we have to get everything right that we've talked about so far for individual pages, and we have to make sure that they're knowable and isolated from their outer context. But we also need to make sure this outer context is accessible and concise. So this is how I think of the accessibility building blocks we're working with in AMP. And if you think about what's in store, I really want to focus on fortifying this foundation at the level of AMP for websites, which in turn strengthens all our formats. Not only that, we can also take special care to improve format-specific accessibility considerations. When we think about strengthening the foundation at the level of the web format, the elephant in the room is the component library. AMP components are what make our pages dynamic and engaging. If we want to up-level their accessibility, then we have to start with understanding where they are at today. So this fall, we worked with the folks at Tetralogical to perform an accessibility audit on our top 10 AMP components, which yielded some new areas of work and increased our team's baseline understanding of the need. Most of these components are available in a number of formats, and some of them are specific to formats entirely. For example, we looked at AMP Add in the first pass. And coming up, we really want to deep dive into the accessibility situation for AMP Story and its associated building blocks. Next, for the components we're auditing, we have to clean up our documentation so the accessibility tools available to developers and the pitfalls that they should be aware of are clear as day. There should be no question at the component level of what you're getting accessibility-wise or what you're missing if we can't do it for you. We've already started making these changes and are hoping to finalize them as the year continues. And soon after that, we want to modernize our development processes. You may recall earlier that audits are part of our design process, but what other processes can incorporate accessibility considerations? This is the question we are working on answering with Tetralogical. Next year, we really want to increase our coverage at the component level and expand to full AMP documents. What is the accessibility story, for example, of the top 1 million AMP pages? How likely is someone to build an accessible page? 
If it's not accessible, how off is it from being accessible? And in that gap, is it something AMP could have done for them? And finally, in 2021 and beyond, some of my dreams are to look into automated accessibility testing so we don't find ourselves in a situation of not knowing our accessibility situation after modifying or adding a few new features and enabling optional accessibility validations. So you can use our rich validator language to help you catch small things that make a big difference, like missing alt text or captions. And after that, who knows? If you have any recommendations for what else we can be doing, please get in touch on GitHub. Thank you. Hello, my dear friends. My name is Alberto. I'm a developer advocate at Google working on efforts related to the AMP open source project. In this session, we are going to talk about building successful sites in WordPress powered by AMP. Google recently launched an initiative called Web Vitals with the goal of providing unified guidance for quality signals that are essential to delivering a great user experience on the web. These quality signals are combined into a ranking factor called page experience. The bottom line is this, all other things being equal, content with better page experiences should rank higher in search results because users will enjoy them more and will likely engage with them more. So the question is, how do we go about getting great page experiences for our pages on any website? The goal of optimizing page experiences is very well aligned with AMP's visions and design principles. From the beginning, AMP has been all about a simple action. Take care of the user experience and everything else will follow. This means that AMP was designed explicitly to be a powerful and cost-effective tool to make it easier for anyone to build sites that bring great page experiences to users, regardless of technical expertise or the amount of resources that we have to make that happen. And it turns out that the capabilities and design principles of AMP are especially useful in a CMS such as WordPress, where most users need and demand turnkey solutions for all the components needed to build their sites, including critical aspects such as performance and usability. For an ecosystem like this, AMP brings what I like to call great page experiences as a service. The question is, how can we take advantage of AMP in WordPress? And here is where the official AMP plugin for WordPress enters the game. This plugin is part of the overall AMP project, and it enables AMP content publishing in WordPress in a way that is seamlessly integrated with the standard publishing workflows of the WordPress platform. The AMP plugin provides many capabilities that you can take advantage of out of the box. It automates as much as possible the process of generating AMP valid markup, minimizing the amount of work that you need to do. It provides effective validation tools to help you deal with AMP incompatibilities if they happen, including tasks such as identifying issues, indicating which components of your site are causing them, and reporting them to you effectively. It also provides support for AMP development to make it easier to build incompatible ecosystem components, such as themes and plugins, and also full websites with AMP compatibility built in. And it allows the serving of AMP pages optimally via capabilities such as mobile redirection, AMP to AMP linking, minimization of AMP validation issues surface to Search Console, and serving of optimized AMP pages by default. So with all these capabilities, who is the audience for the AMP plugin? The good news is the AMP plugin can be beneficial to anyone regardless of technical expertise. For technically savvy users, such as developers, the plugin provides powerful and effective developer tools to help them do AMP development and build plugins and themes as well as full sites. For non-developers or less tech-savvy users, or if you simply don't want to deal with validation issues and tackle development tasks, the AMP plugin allows you to assemble fully AMP compatible sites out of AMP components and it helps you cope with validation issues in easy and effective ways. How do we use the plugin in practice? I'm glad you asked. The plugin provides three different configuration options for bringing the power of AMP to your website. Depending on the option that you choose, the plugin will use one or two sets of theme templates to render your content 
and you may have either your whole site on AMP or you may have an AMP version of your site and a non-AMP version of your site. We call this option template modes and there are three of them. In standard mode, there is a single set of theme templates for rendering your content and there is only one version for your site, the AMP version. This is the ideal configuration as your whole site is served as AMP for both desktop and mobile visitors. And this is a great choice for sites where all components used, such as themes and plugins, are fully incompatible, or if you have resources to do some custom AMP development and fix AMP validation issues if they happen. Let's take a look at a site using this mode. The key thing to remember in standard mode is that your site uses a single theme and there is a single version of your site. And therefore, all of your content is served on AMP for both desktop and mobile visitors. For example, TOL.org is a new site, simple, but a very slick site. We can see that the AMP validator Chrome extension is telling us that this site is powered by AMP. And because it is using standard mode, AMP will be served for all four factors and the site looks equally beautiful in all of them. This is the desktop version, has a nice layout. By the way, look at the GDPR cooking consent notice available. We can check also how it looks in, in the tablet format look equally nice, of course. And we can take a look at the smaller form factor. That's the phone, nice layout. And here we can see that there is a hamburger menu, responsive menu, a bunch of categories, um, have a search bar, and they have even a donate capability, which is very nice. We can take a look also as a post. See that uh, the article layout is done and it looks very beautiful. It has social sharing. And if we go all the way down, we can see that user also can comment on the articles. Basically, they have all the features they need for the users to get a great experience for the site, and everything is AMP. Another site that has been built using the AMP plugin in standard mode is the website for the AMP plugin itself. Again, it's not a complex site, but it's a beautiful design and it looks very snappy. By the way, you should check this site to learn more about the AMP plugin. You can find here good documentation about the plugin, how to get started, some playbooks, reference docs. And also, the site has a showcase section that lists sites in the wild that are being powered by the AMP plugin in the different modes. There is also an ecosystem section that provides curated, non exhaustive lists of plugins and themes that are known to be incompatible. And we recently added a section on AMP experts that are dev agencies and freelancers that do AMP development and they are able and willing to help anybody that needs them. Again, the AMP plugin is in standard mode. It looks beautiful in all four factors. This is the desktop. You know, we saw the tablet format looks nice as well. And we can go to smaller form factors like a mobile phone. And here again, we have our hamburger menu. We don't have too much stuff here, but you know, we have a search bar, a download button, and so on. I hope these sites give you a small glimpse of what is possible when you use the AMP plugin in standard mode. In transitional mode, there is also a single set of theme templates for rendering your content. But in this case, there are two versions of your site a non AMP version, which can be served to visitors coming from desktop devices and an AMP version which can be served to visitors from either desktop or mobile devices. This is a good choice for sites that use a theme that is not fully incompatible, for example, but the functional difference between the AMP and non-AMP version are acceptable. This is also applies for plugins, by the way. And it is also a good choice if you have the capacity to do AMP development and you want to work progressively towards making your site fully incompatible and then switch to standard mode, the ideal case. Let's take a look at a site using transitional mode. The key thing to remember in transitional mode is that we get some of the same benefit of standard mode in terms of having a single fully responsive AMP theme. But in this case, there are two versions of your site, the AMP version and the non-AMP version. For example, here I have a site running locally. I am using 2020, which is the latest uh, WordPress core theme. And I'm using Jetpack, which is a popular plugin 
pro that provides a wide range of functional modules. Many of them are incompatible, but not all of them are incompatible yet. So in particular, we are using social share buttons, in this case, Twitter and Facebook. And if we go to the footer, we are using two widgets, the Google Translate widget and one that is called the Milestone widget. We said that transitional mode may be used if we have a site where the theme and the plugins used are not necessarily fully incompatible, but the visual and functional difference between the AMP and online versions of your site are acceptable or if you have resources to fix the differences and move towards standard mode. To see how far are we from standard mode, we can use the capability of the AMP plugin, which lets you do pair browsing when in transitional mode, so you can see the similarities and differences between both versions of your site. With pair browsing, you have on the left, you have the non-AMP version of your site, and on the right, you have the AMP version of your site. You can see that the social shared buttons look almost identical. There is just a styling issue on the link that can be fixed easily. And if we continue if we scroll the site, the site looks identical as well. And in the widget, we notice that the Google Translate widget is not appearing in the AMP version. And that is because it uses custom JavaScript and that is not allowed and the plugin is stripping it out. And the milestone widget, it works, but in the non-AMP version, it off updates via JavaScript frequently, and in the AMP version, it only updates when the page is reloaded. So here, we need to make an assessment and determine if we don't really need the pieces that do not work, and therefore we can avoid them, or determine that we do need them, and then we either stay in transitional mode and keep those pieces on the non-AMP version of our site, or we need to fix them. And fixing them means either finding a solution that is incompatible in the ecosystem, or doing some cost of development to make them happen. So this gives you an idea of the approach that must be followed if you use the plugin in transitional mode and move your way towards standard mode. In rhythm mode, there are two different sets of theme templates for rendering your content. And there are also two versions of your site, a non on version, which again can be served to visitors coming from desktop devices, and a non version, which can be served to visitors coming from mobile devices. This mode may be selected if your site is using a highly AMP incompatible theme and you are not technically savvy, or when you simply don't want to deal with incompatibilities and prefer to have a simplified workflow to get AMP experiences to your users. Let's see an example of a read the mode site. Read the mode is similar to transitional mode in that there are also two versions of your site, but in read the mode, two different themes are used. We said that rhythm mode may be used if we have a site where the theme and plugins used are very much not incompatible. And while we should strive for the ideal standard mode configuration, we may not be able to switch to a more compatible set of components at this moment, but we still want to bring unpowered experiences to our users coming to us from mobile devices. For example, here we have a sample site running locally with a non amp compatible theme as the active theme. It is a neat site with a lot of structure and sections, a nice image carousel, um, sidebars, and so on. We can configure the theme to be used by the AMP version of our site in the setting screens of the AMP plugin. First, I can use what is called the AMP legacy theme, which is a very simple set of templates to serve baseline AMP experiences. Going back to the site, we see that the homepage does not have an AMP version because legacy AMP only works on post AMP pages. But if we click on an article, we land first on the non-AMP version, which can be served visitors coming from desktop devices. But if we switch to the AMP version, it takes us to a simple but neat experience which can be served to users coming from the mobile devices. In read and mode, we also have the option of using any compatible theme as the theme for the AMP version of our site. For example, I can select the latest WordPress core theme 2020 as the theme for the AMP version of my site. And if we go back to the site, we can see that the homepage now has an AMP version as denoted by the Chrome AMP extension. And if we click in the same article as before, and we go to the AMP version of it, we can see that now we get the look and feel and functional capabilities of the 2020 core theme.
It's a very nice layout. I have hamburger menu. Um, I also have the search bar capability. And if we go back down, we see the social sharing, commenting capabilities, the whole nine yards. In addition to these configuration options, the plugin provides tools to make your AMP content publishing experiences as frictionless as possible. For example, with Flexible AMP, the AMP plugin gives you the flexibility to incorporate AMP into your site progressively. You can select which part of your site should be served on AMP and which should not with fine granularity. It also gives you mobile redirection, which means that when the plugin is configured in either transitional or rhythm mode, you can automatically redirect mobile users to the AMP version of your site so they get AMP experiences when they need it the most. And with mobile redirection, the plugin automatically enables AMP to AMP linking, allowing your mobile visitors to stay on an AMP version of your site once they land on any AMP page. The AMP plugin gives you the ability to install plugins that are not AMP compatible and then let them run only on the non-AMP version of your site. The plugin provides also support to make it easier for you to keep the total amount of CSS on, on any page under the 75 kilobytes limit imposed by AMP. And it does this by shaking the tree of CSS for a page and automatically removing as much on new CSS as possible. I hope that this brief overview gave you a good sense of the capabilities of the official AMP plugin for WordPress. The message that I want you to take home from this talk is this. With the capabilities of the AMP framework and the control mechanism it imposes, you can take advantage of the openness and flexibility of WordPress while minimizing the amount of resources you need to invest on developing and maintaining sites that bring great page experiences consistently to your users. Now, there are several ways to get started, learn more, and stay up to date with both the AMP project and the official AMP plugin for WordPress. Go ahead and download the plugin from the WordPress plugin repository. The AMP plugin is also part of the AMP project and therefore it means that it's fully open source. You can follow its development and contribute if you would like to in GitHub. Check also the AMP plugin website, which has lots of information about the AMP plugin and cool stories to read. And also, make sure that you check the content of the AMP YouTube channel, including the brand new AMP in WordPress video series. Finally, I want to tell you, all the talks in AMP Fest are great, and I recommend them all. These particular three, I really enjoy them, and go next to them if you have a time. Pleasure to talk to you, and thank you. Hi and welcome everyone. I'm Thomas from Jung von Matt in Hamburg, Germany. Measured by the number of awards, Jung von Matt is the most successful advertising agency group in the German-speaking world in terms of both creativity and efficiency. We offer our clients innovative and effective marketing communication solutions across all channels and disciplines. I am the managing director of Jung von Matt Tech. We are specialized in the development of digital products from ideation to design and implementation. For us and our clients, the web is still one of the most important digital channels. As the only marketing channel completely controlled by brands, the web is becoming a central hub and destination for a variety of communication activities aimed to attract new users, inspiring existing users with a great product presentation and converting digital business. The demand for an appealing presentation of content on the web by providing excellent usability, built-in performance and accessibility has increased dramatically in recent years. This is due to the client's goal to deliver the same user experience that users have become used to from native apps. The problem, however, is that costs and time pressure have increased in the same time as budgets have become smaller. So change your work. In order to continue to meet these expectations, we as an agency had to find new processes and instruments. When we design web projects with AMP, we benefit from a variety of features it has to offer. Many are aimed 
at making processes faster and more efficient and simplify your work. So we have three principles. Three things where AMP help us to react to these requirements. A lot of effort is often invested in the same base work in agencies. Beside the necessary content structuring, too much energy flows into the description of modules. Some of my favorite examples of these basic modules are the video player, of which hundreds of variations have already been built, or a responsive high-quality image gallery, or a solid privacy consent solution. For suitable projects, we skip reinventing those modules and instead build on AMP's toolbox. Once learned, you can reuse AMP components for your purpose. They can easily be adapted to corporate design guidelines or customized in different ways. From our experience with AMP, we can derive three guiding principles. First, build on existing stuff. In the past, projects in creative agencies always started from scratch. For example, every element on a website was always rethought and functionality requirements for each project were formulated anew. But often things always work the same way, while only being designed differently. A video player has a play button, a timeline, a volume control and a time display. A sidebar opens above the content and has navigation elements. When you design and build these things from scratch, it takes a lot of time, especially when it comes to the technical implementation later on. With the AMP components, this step is no longer necessary, because they provide a solid base to build upon. You only have to adapt the components to the desired visual design. Here are two AMP carousel examples. For the Hamburg City Bike Portal, Fahrrad Hamburg, we use the AMP carousel as a storytelling format for a product tour from the handlebars to the rear wheel. The BMW.com establishes a classic teaser slider based on the AMP carousel. Second, streamline the process with Lean UX. The work of designers and the documents they create actually only serve the purpose of communication within the team. Everything we describe with words is perceived differently by each person. That's why we design mockups, build wireframes and create prototypes just so that everyone involved has the same understanding of the final product. This is not a good method, because it's a very rigid process that can't react to frequently changing customer requirements. Especially for smaller web projects, which we implement with AMP, we can skip wireframes and the mockups. We directly build prototypes with AMP, which quickly become the finished product. Our best example for speed is the Huawei Future Promise landing page that we built in just two and a half days. Huawei actively promoted the site on Twitter and we had a great performance KPIs. Third, Jacob's Law. What at first sounds like a death for creativity and diversity in websites, let our designers once again witness the evolution of our own work. Our main task is to create the best possible user experience for the user, so that our clients achieve the business goals. Design is always directly related to function and should not be confused with art. This does not mean that we will all just build the same interfaces, but we must always be clear about who we design things for, the user. Luckily, AMP knows this too and brings popular UX patterns which are primarily only known from native apps to the web. Our current favorite example, web stories. A new format that we currently like to use are web stories, a successful native format for snackable storytelling, now also on the web. Here are two examples, once again from BMW and a social project for Sea-Watch in cooperation with Ben & Jerry. The Sea-Watch story generator was created in only three days and can be maintained with a contentful content management system. Our conclusion. AMP accelerated our development process and consistently ensure high execution quality. How does it work? 
The dilemma of choice. AMP reduces, with its great ready-to-use components, the dilemma of choice. For example, sure enough, without the carefully crafted AMP carousel, we might by now have implemented the thousands variation of an image gallery. Velocity. Developing AMP pages, for the greater part, is done using HTML and CSS. As long as you don't need AMP script with support for custom JavaScript. This comes with a really flat learning curve that also allows junior developers to work on AMP project. Project stability. The AMP components are rocket proofed and the AMP framework update itself with an evergreen mode. That's from us. Thank you. Good morning, good evening, and good afternoon, wherever you are. Nice to meet you. In this session, I'd like to share the five ways Recruit maintains high performance and productivity using AMP. Starting with a brief intro of myself, I'm Yosuke, a software engineer in Recruit, a digital service company in Japan. I'm also one of the core contributors to Node.js, and you can find me on social media accounts such as Twitter, and GitHub, please say hi. I've been working as an engineer for around 15 years, and there have always been challenges in solving both the trade-offs between performance and productivity. We should definitely keep the web app's performance and developer's productivity high, but it's not an easy thing to achieve both at the same time. Here's a quote from the father of the analysis of algorithms. Donald Knuth says, premature optimization is the root of all evil. I can totally relate to this message and recall myself working on optimizing nested groups that don't contribute at all to perceived performance but sacrificing readability. And I'm not saying performance is not important. It is. But the theme is more around, yes, we should improve the performance, but let's keep the productivity nice and sweet. Earlier this year, we launched a brand new web application called Hot Pepper Beauty Cosme, a web application to share and consume latest cosmetic trends. Based on research, we were able to determine that the majority of users read cosmetic articles while commuting and during transit. This means in Japan, the users will be checking the site on a bus or a train which indicates that the site needs to be performant in a mobile device and in a random network environment. As I mentioned earlier, the key to build and maintain a performant web product is also caring about the developer's productivity. Out of many different options that we have in 2020, to tackle this theme, we chose AMP as a full stack service to build the type of maintainable application. This means we are not only using AMP in our landing pages, but the whole site is built with AMP just like other sites use frameworks such as React and Vue. As a result, we are able to build the web app strictly keeping delivery timelines and also achieving the Core Web Vitals metrics after the launch. I'm actually pretty happy with this result. So we thought it might be interesting to share what we actually did using AMP to achieve our goals. But we want to be real. Everything has two sides, good and something not that great. I hope sharing both the highlights and the lowlights in using AMP and how we overcame obstacles would help the developers who are thinking of using AMP. So let's get things started. The very first point, we leveraged from AMP is to use it as a component library. There were many types of developers in my team, both expertise and seniority, CSS expert, server-side engineer, JavaScript beginner, and such. It's really easy for the team with multiple background to rely on JavaScript to build the websites. Some, of course, could be a necessary script but in general, most of those scripts are not used correctly and maintained. We have built some web apps before. The common performance bottleneck 
was this unused JavaScript. But as you know, AMP does not allow random JavaScript, and in contrast, it provides a built-in web components that we can reuse. We can expect constant performance by using the built-in components since there are no JavaScript that harms the page rendering, and reusing existing libraries of components will likely improve and productivity. We feel the core benefit of using AMP is not becoming fast, but rather the benefit is allowed not likely to become slow. Any developer can maintain the web app by leveraging built-in components while keeping constant performance. But here is the thing. Are things that easy? Of course, AMP encapsulates the complex logic and building performant web apps. But if you are maintaining a service used by hundreds of thousands of users, we feel you need to have at least the best baseline knowledge of how the web works. For example, when relying on a particular third-party library, there could always be bugs. You'd need to debug what's not working and might need to act before AMP gets fixed. In this particular case, we suffered from images not showing up in IE 11. To make our website reliable, we needed to debug the problem on our own and fix the version of the AMP library. Our suggestion here is, don't think AMP is something magical. There could be cases where you need to customize it to fit your unique requirements. There could be cases where you need to debug problems. There is no silver bullet in updating technical knowledge, but we managed to train our beginners by pair and mob programming. Aside from that, to avoid unnecessary degradation experience, AMP has a new option of using the LTS version of the library, so consider using that. The next topic I would like to share is regarding the ecosystem around AMP to maintain your productivity. It is always recommended to use the appropriate environments to be productive while using AMP. Our team uses React for various projects. However, we prefer using Next.js, the server-side framework for serving React-based applications. The great thing is that Next.js now has a built-in support for AMP and it can be easily enabled by just toggling the config. This means we can build our own components and web apps using React while leveraging AMP as the underlying HTML framework, which is a great thing in many ways since this would also mean that we can leverage the existing React ecosystem to accelerate our development. For example, styled components. If you are a React developer, you may have familiarity with styled components, which are a powerful library to style your React component. We are actually using this library to add style to our React component, which ultimately publishes AMP pages on the server side. This sounds awesome. And sure, it is great to be able to use our well-known libraries and frameworks. However, does it actually work? Are there any compatibility caveats? We feel the ecosystem around using AMP as a service is still in an evolving phase, and there could be cases where things might not just work out of the box. In this case, when we use stride components as AMP components which are not standard elements of the web, building a wrapper React component for each one of the AMP components was necessary. At that time, this was still not yet fully documented and we needed to figure out how to make things more compatible by ourselves. This is not an AMP specific problem, but rather a typical journey that everyone experiences when their ecosystem evolves. Sharing your knowledge and experiences through your global community can help bring us all closer to finding universal best practices. We covered the architecture around publishing AMP pages while also verifying that productivity remained in place. So the question here is, is it easy enough to maintain the components built by AMP its ecosystem? We first need to understand that the web front-end libraries and technologies update rapidly. And generally speaking, keeping up with the updates is not an easy thing to do. 
And of course, AMP and Next.js are not an exception. Their libraries and frameworks change day by day. Some updates might cause new cases for your users and the side effect may break your existing implementation. The worst option here is not updating your libraries. This can cause it to become stale and unmaintainable. Updating your software is not easy. However, it should always be a priority to try to stay on the latest and greatest. Our suggestion here is keep up with the updates but mitigate unexpected changes. For example, we are using Storybook to check how the components we built with AMP look like. It makes our processes to review the visual changes when updating the library easier. We are also mitigating visual degradation by actually diffing the look of each component in CI. For example, if there was something wrong with AMP image, we would know that in advance of the production release. We think by adding validation processes to check the stability of your application, especially using third-party libraries, is important. This is not a specific problem of AMP, and rather a general operational best practice. But of course, it's not an exception of AMP. We think our service is more reliable with having this process while keeping up with the updates. Operational excellence after launching your AMP fast site is also important. In our team, we are trying as much as possible to keep the operation simple and same as other websites that we own. When thinking about operation, there could be other teams that care about your site. For example, the marketing team might be interested in measuring success of your site or the product manager might want to add personalized contents. In neither, case of the, in neither of the cases, first party cookies takes an important role and therefore keeping your URL consistent matters. That is why we chose off-cache AMP for our application. This means we are not leveraging AMP cache and always serving our pages from our region. This makes things really simple and operational parity with any other sites. The trade-off here is all the wonderful optimization AMP cache provides automatically and also the privacy preserving prefetch that it enables. But luckily, we have solutions for both of the cases. Next.js has built-in support for AMP optimizer and it enables equivalent optimization AMP cache provides. Also, Google is committed to bringing instant loading that do not rely on AMP using web platform features like signed exchange. This really is a, a good trend we are seeing in the ecosystem. But you might be asking, is a complete off-cache site actually supported by AMP and related tool chains. The fastest and the easiest way to off-cache your document is make an invite AMP. We are simply removing the lightning bolt emoji from the HTML tag for this purpose. But invite AMP would also mean that it fails in the validation process using the AMP validator. In our case, Next.js was running a built-in AMP validator, which prevented us to publish our intended but invalid AMP document. We solved this by actually fixing Next.js itself to allow using custom AMP validation logic. We think AMP validator is important to make sure that your app is compatible with the AMP runtime. So in this case, we only removed the validation logic around the lightning bolt emoji. There could be other issues you might face, but our suggestion here is to contribute to the AMP ecosystem to validate your use case. The open source community should be waiting for you to participate. While we overcome our obstacles of enabling off-cache AMP, the way I mentioned, I'm very happy and excited to see the AMP team now announcing its official support of the use case by soon adding a declarative option in the HTML. Very easy and simple. This is worth trying out. I've walked through a lot regarding the productivity tips, but let me finish off by talking about performance. In fact, we think AMP is more than enabling good performance, but a well lit path to adapt the latest best practices. First off, 
Our site is fully compatible with PWA, AMP and PWA work well together and that can be easily achieved. For example, AMP provides a predefined service worker for AMP pages and all you need to do is call the init function. Also, as I mentioned earlier, our site while being off cache is fully compatible with the Core Web Vitals metrics. I'm very happy seeing all the metrics passing the first threshold of the 75 percentile data. But does this mean if I was using AMP, I wouldn't need to care about anything? Should I just leave everything that AMP does implicitly? It should be mentioned that AMP is yet another web page and your implementation affects performance. The page could be slower when adding new features and such. And the reality is, while AMP is a well lit path towards achieving the core web vitals, not 100% of AMP sites are compatible. And we should also be aware of the metrics that the ecosystem cares about could be changing as well. So our suggestion here is, don't implicitly rely everything on AMP, but set your own KPIs, measure your performance, and set performance budgets for your website. We are using Lighthouse CI to check with our relevant simulated environment and Chrome user experience report to track the LAMP data. For example, we detected a sudden drop in the performance score when Lighthouse updated the metrics and we are currently working on the optimization. While AMP helps adapting best practices, there is more you can do to make the experience better. To wrap it up, I covered these five points that we cared about when developing an AMP first site. AMP can be used as a component library and it goes well with the modern web front-end ecosystem. Maintenance and operation is important as well, where you can adapt your own process to check the stability of AMPs and simplify running the site by off-cache AMP. And last but not least, use AMP to easily follow the latest web best practices. And the great thing is that we are seeing very positive results, not just performance, but also in monthly active users right after the release. We feel that this indicates that the site we developed is providing a satisfying user experience powered by AMP. I believe that AMP is indeed one of the greatest options to build performant web apps while being productive. We have an evolving and passionate ecosystem that will help us guide through the journey. But I would also want to point out, as we have covered in this talk by walking through how we overcame the obstacles, that there are actually more you can do as a developer, whether it's contributing to the open source community or building your own process internally to make your AMP site better. Let's together strengthen AMP and the ecosystem. Thank you. Hi, I'm Violeta Rosales, Software Engineering Manager at UNOTV. UNOTV is the number one digital native news outlet in Mexico, with more than 13 million unique users per month, and those users mainly consume our content on their mobile devices. We started using AMP more than three years ago as part of our content distribution strategy. For about a year, we worked internally with all the teams involved in the publishing, monetization, and development of our website, evaluating whether going full AMP was the right solution for us and not just the light version of our website. One of the biggest challenges of being such a small team was keeping up with all the updates of the distribution platforms, such as our website, our Android app, our iOS app, the Google News Feed, the Facebook Instant Articles, and the AMP pages. We managed to find a solution for all of our challenges. The editorial team needed support for all kinds of embeds. The commercial team needed responsive ad units, header bidding, native ads, and in-stream ads. This solution reduced our workload, and now we're only supporting AMP 
as our main distribution platform and instant articles. AMP has all the components that your editorial team needs, like video players, we use Ujala, then Brightcove, now JW Player, and YouTube. They are all supported. Social embeds and social share, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and everything that can be embedded in an iframe. Plus, with AMP Google Document Embed, you can embed a PDF as a viewer, and this is just an example of many other components that your team can use. AMP has all your commercial team needs, like multi-size ads. This is a tricky one. As you may know, you can always use the attribute data multi-size in your AMP ad component, but there are a lot of rules. For example, this is a totally valid multi-size ad. The original size is 300 by 600 pixels, but it can also serve a 300 by 250 pixels. But this couldn't be a 300 by 250 pixels also showing a 300 by 600 pixel SAT because the rule says you can go smaller, but you cannot go bigger. If your ad is below the fold, it would resize. But if it's not, the 300 by 250 pixels will show in a 300 by 600 space. Responsive ads. The responsive layout should only be used if the creative supports responsive ads, for example, native ads like Tabula. If you intend to display different creatives for different screen resolutions, here's a trick that worked for us. We have a little port banner, 728 by 90 on desktop, but on mobile, it should be 320 by 100. To achieve this, we're using two AMPADS components with a media attribute. The desktop banner will only display if the screen width is 801 pixels or more, and the mobile banner will only display if the screen width is 800 pixels or less. We watch the network requests, and if you launch the page on desktop, it will only make one request for the 728 creative and the other way around if you launch it on mobile. I've seen many publishers adopting a full AMP, but most of the times are only amplifying their article pages. But we decided to take a really full experience because there was really no impediment to do so. All of our pages are AMP pages, our homepage, the section pages, the article pages, the about, the legal pages, and the search results. The only page that required a bit of extra effort was the search page result. Since we're using Elasticsearch API, we are rendering the results within an AMP list. To do so, I would recommend using query params to get the search term from the URL and then use it on the call to your search API as you can see in the source attribute. You can also have a load more button, including the attributes load more and load more bookmark in your AMP list. The load more bookmark will fetch the URL defined in the key next in your search API, so be sure to include it with an offset. We have explored different solutions for mobile apps, from native Android and iOS apps to Ionic apps consuming an API for the content. Now, with the AMP first website, we decided to build our apps around the solution. We are currently using a React Native wrapper and displaying our content using web views. This way, the user has a good experience because the content loads fast and this decision helps us to better manage all of our development resources. What started as a way to optimize our workflow had a big positive impact in our website overall. In terms of performance, our page speed went down by 64% from 19 to 7 seconds. In terms of monetization, the ad server calls is 30% lower, which translates to saving money. Our fill rate increased 33%, so more ads are being served. In terms of traffic, our organic search increased 68% and our social traffic increased 181%. Our next steps are improving the web vitals in our AMP pages, 
and dropping the React Native shell to build a progressive web app with trusted web activity instead of the web view. Thanks for watching. I hope most of the mysticism about AMP as a light version of the website has been clear. If you have any questions, drop me a line on Twitter at Violetisha. Hello, my name is Jason Caldwell. I am the growth engineering lead at Automatic. We're the parent company of WordPress.com. WordPress.com is a hosted version of the WordPress open source software, and it's really the very best way to experience WordPress. Launched in 2005, WordPress.com gave internet denizens with little to no technical background the ability to create blogs and websites for free. WordPress has since exploded into a global open source content management system with thousands of plugins and themes that empower users. From businesses and nonprofits to hobbyists, enthusiasts, and influencers of every stripe with the ability to create all kinds of websites. As of today, 38% of the web is built on WordPress. At Automatic, the WordPress.com marketing division began experimenting with AMP in 2018. AMP definitely piqued our interest because the speed of WordPress.com affects every metric we care about. Things like time to first byte, bounce rate, SEO, reader satisfaction, average session duration, cost efficiency, and conversion rate. This is particularly true for paid search ads that we run because we have marketing landing pages that target high value keywords, such as create a site and build a website. By converting landing pages to AMP, we hoped to improve WordPress.com's click-through and sign-up conversion rates. By converting landing pages to AMP, we hoped to improve WordPress.com's click-through and sign-up conversion rates. The first thing we tackled was CSS. We had to strip away all unused CSS to get under the 75 kilobyte limit. This took a bit of work and it taught us a lot. For example, our pages were previously loading a lot of heavy CSS as part of a design framework. By only loading the CSS we really needed on any given page, we were able to reduce overhead substantially. Ultimately, all of our CSS had to be highly optimized and inlined because in order to pass AMP validation, we needed to eliminate all external style sheets and stay within the 75 kilobyte limit for best performance. Another challenge was figuring out how to handle Google Ads and other trackers, including Google Analytics and our own internal data platform. Given the large number of analytics partners that we work with and the fact that Google's AMP cache loads our landing pages from a different domain via the AMP content delivery network, we initially faced several cross-domain cookie and client ID tracking challenges. To get AMP landing pages to work with our internal data platform, we were able to set up linkers using the AMP analytics component. Linkers pass important tracking IDs from AMP landing pages out through the query string attached to each link that a user clicks on. So by linking these tracking IDs, we pass them from the AMP landing pages back to application pages on our domain. We were then able to receive the tracking IDs in the query string of incoming clicks and map those IDs to our own internal data platform. Google Ads and Google Analytics both take a similar approach. We made a few minor adjustments to our Google Analytics configuration. The required changes were all well-documented by the Google Analytics platform, and they were not too much trouble. We also learned how to use several AMP components more extensively in an effort to reach parity with things like navigation menus, page layouts, and embedded media from the original designs that we were working with. For example, we tracked navigation menu state using the AMP bind and AMP state components. And of course, we use many instances of things like the AMP image component with various configurations. I do remember that it was quite frustrating back in 2018 when we couldn't use any custom JavaScript in AMP pages. 
This has since been resolved with the introduction of the AMP script component, so we haven't had this trouble since. Fast forward a few weeks from when we first started, and we had our first few AMP landing pages completed. Next, we used cookie-based splits to A-B test the AMP pages against the original regular HTML landing pages. We use paid search ads to run these A-B split tests. Our marketing division relies in part on paid traffic, so we really wanted to test the user experience for that group of people, and based on test results, then make a decision about whether to continue with AMP as a tool for more effective marketing. It is worth mentioning that we ran this paid search test by setting up two visually identical landing pages at two slightly different URLs. One page was built using regular HTML. The other was built using AMP. The Google Ads campaign that we ran distributed traffic to each of these pages equally. The results were better than we expected. In terms of speed, we definitely saw a boost in performance with the AMP version of our pages. But we also saw huge cost savings, primarily with mobile paid search ads, which we did not quite expect. It was a pleasant surprise. We saw a 6% lift in conversions, a 35% lower CPC in page search, and an 80% increase in page speed. It was really nice to be able to put those numbers down and say, hey, look, here are the benefits that we're seeing from this work. Since then, we've converted many of our existing landing pages to AMP, and we're building new landing pages with an AMP-first approach. This makes us more efficient. Instead of building pages in multiple formats, we're now trying to build only with AMP, and we're doing our best to adhere to community guidelines and best practices for performance from start to finish. As of today, each month, we're serving hundreds of thousands of WordPress.com page views in the AMP format. Quite simply, AMP makes us happy. Engineers are happy, and our marketing and finance teams are happy. These are the folks who keep an eye on our bottom line. The turning point for agreeing to go AMP first with landing pages was really the lightning fast delivery of these pages through Google Search. On mobile devices, Google preloads AMP landing pages that appear in search results. Our AMP landing pages then load much, much faster, of course, and they perform better, which leads to a huge cost savings for us in Google Ads. We really did learn a lot along the way. Going AMP first opened our eyes to a whole world of possibilities with AMP. We have since improved support for AMP at WordPress.com. If your goal is to create high performing web pages, AMP provides a fantastic framework that will get you there. And we're now passing all that we've learned onto our customers. At WordPress.com, we've worked hard to improve our AMP ready themes and plugins. And the AMP plugin for WordPress is now available for all of the WordPress websites that we host. And every post that you publish at WordPress.com supports the AMP format automatically. So, I'd like to invite you all to sign up for free and try it out for yourselves. Go to WordPress.com, create your first site, and publish your first post using our all-new block editor. On mobile devices, Google will deliver the AMP version of all posts that you publish at WordPress.com automatically. For all WordPress.com sites, AMP is enabled by default. Customers on our business plan or higher can install custom plugins and themes including the official AMP for WordPress plugin, which provides additional features and functionality. So thanks for allowing me to share our AMP success story with you today. We're really looking forward to all that we can do with AMP at WordPress.com. Hi, my name is Antonio Gonzalez, CTO at Televisa Digital in Mexico City. Today, I'm going to tell you about how we got into AMP. Televisa is one of the biggest and more relevant media organizations in the Spanish-speaking market. It is a complex broadcasting ecosystem, and whenever we settle with one determined technology, change can be a challenge. If we plan to move towards a technological upgrade, we may encounter a long and complex journey. We implemented AMP in 2017, 
as an alternative to the optimize our websites, resulting in an evident improvement in performance. Thanks to these results and the maturity of the framework, we decided to migrate Noticieros Televisa to AMP first at the end of 2019 because we were searching for new tools that could help us improve Noticieros Televisa web performance. Now, more than ever, performance is directly related with growth and we wanted to be ready for that. For a news media like us, it is of vital importance to have a fast site, focused on mobile and relevant enough for Google. More than 85% of our traffic comes from mobile devices, so upgrading web experience for our mobile user was crucial for our success in the short as well as the long term. After analyzing the possibilities, we decided it was time for us to work with AMP first. Why? Because it offered a mature framework with great community support. It also promised an almost instant loading AMP page in mobile devices without losing design or quality. We saw in AMP first the opportunity to develop a responsive platform on mobile devices, improve page load times from the AMP cache, and also have more relevance in Google searches, thanks to the rich results feature. AMP migration represented many challenges. We had to do it gradually and as transparently as possible for our users. We redesigned our site thinking in an AMP first approach that allow us to use the framework to its maximum potential. First, we began with a configuration in which we had an AMP and a no AMP version of our site. At this stage, we just had to implement some hooks so that ads could be integrated. And we also had to add meta tags to the site's head for the purpose of SEO. Then, while we were planning a complete redesign on Noticieros Televisa, we decided to take that opportunity to change to an AMP first scheme, in which we are currently working on. In order to achieve this, we used AMP official plugin for WordPress. As we began seeing AMP potential, we decided to experiment with the development of a theme for WordPress that was made almost entirely with AMP HTML components. This also helped us make more efficient the process of transformation and validation. We also applied best practices in CSS and eliminated unnecessary scripts in WordPress core. In the end, this helped a lot to decrease AMP's plugin workload. So as you can see, our development with AMP was possible with just two simple steps. Thanks to its well-organized documentation and support from a large community across the web, AMP makes it very easy to develop by being simple and clear. This helped the development team shortening the implementation times and thus allowing them to be more productive. Today, our results speak for themselves. Since AMP was first implemented in news, entertainment, and sports, we have had more than 400 million users brought to our pages exclusively by AMP. Thousands of articles are uploaded daily on AMP. Loading speed on our pages increased and organic traffic grew across all our websites. Just in our entertainment site, organic traffic increased by 33% since AMP was integrated, and their performance score went from 14 to 73 points. By the end of 2019, the success of AMP in Noticieros Televisa led us to integrate it in another additional eight sites. Using the official AMP plugin gave us very positive results. AMP is now part of our web development process. Nowadays, we have a design and markup team who are in charge of making mockups with an AMP first approach, thereby accelerating our production process. As a matter of fact, two of our blogs, Oinkoink and Bitmeet, were created from scratch with an AMP first vision. Together, these two blogs have added 22 million unique users so far in 2020. Let me tell you about our next steps. We wanted to take AMP to the next level and implement it in all of Televisa digital ecosystem. We know this is a big challenge, but given the current results, the benefits for our organization look quite promising. Our journey with AMP first began a year ago, and today we're certain that we made the best decision. Our sites have a better performance and are more relevant than ever in Google, which translate into more organic traffic. WordPress integration process was fast and easy thanks to the official plugin. It doesn't matter if you are a small blog 
or a large media company, AMP can help substantially improve your web technology. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for AmpFest so far. My name is Nana Raisinghani, and I'm a product manager on the AMP project. So far, everything you've heard is about what the next year holds for the AMP team. However, we also wanted to take the time to shed some light on what the upcoming years hold for the team as well. Now, users are still frustrated with the web because the experiences that they have on the web is incredibly poor. When they click on a page, the page loads slowly, and when content appears on the screen, it's not interactive. And when it is interactive, it might get displaced by other units on the page that are still loading. And this is why the Chrome team launched a new initiative called Web Vitals. It means to allow developers to focus on the performance metrics that matter and have a path to creating a high performing page for their users. It's made up of metrics such as largest contentful paint that measures loading, first input delay that measures interactivity, and cumulative layout shift that measures visual stability. Now you can learn more about these metrics on web.dev slash vitals. The Google search team has also announced that it will build upon core web vitals to measure how the page is experienced by a user in addition to prior signals such as a page's usefulness. This suite of measurements is called page experience. Page experience will also use other pre-existing signals such as mobile friendliness, safe browsing, HTTPS security, and detection for intrusive interstitials. It's a great way for performance advocates to have targeted metrics to consider when thinking about the experience that their users are having. Now, AMP lines up pretty well with the goals of Core Web Vitals and page experience as well. In fact, it is our goal that AMP be the most cost-effective and simple solution for publishers who are trying to create a great page experience. And to hear more about this, you can listen to Ben Morse's talk on page experience and AMP. With the page experience announcement, there has been a shift in the way that Google is now measuring the experience that users get when they're landing on a page instead of requiring a specific format to assure great user experience. As of today, when teams are thinking about their web investment, they have one of three options. First, a custom setup that uses your framework of choice and allows the team to hyper-optimize every part of the site's performance. The benefit here is that this is something that your team is already comfortable with, and it is the least constrictive in terms of how you want to monetize, analyze, target users, etc. However, you still have to meet the criteria that is set out by page experience. And the challenge here is that you have to invest in specific teams whose responsibility it is to monitor, maintain, and then correct a site's performance and make sure that it lines up with what users expect. Now, you could also invest in AMP by either investing in paired AMP, which a lot of publishers do. Here, AMP acts as your performance team, your QA team, your infrastructure team, and it does it all for free. Now, we do our best to make sure that your sites are performant in the long run. But the drawback here is something that you've already experienced. There are monetization constraints as well. And this is by design to make sure that we're able to create performance sites that offer great user experience. However, the largest problem with investing in paired AMP is that you're signing up to maintaining two code bases in the long run. You can address this by investing in AMP first. You can use AMP as your library of choice to create great web experiences. And this builds on top of paired AMP, but doesn't have the ongoing dual code base maintenance cost. This is all well and good, right? But what does building a site with AMP actually look like today? Both Paired AMP and AMP First have their own opportunity costs. Paired AMP has the ongoing maintenance costs I mentioned, and AMP First may not be capable enough in some cases. And even when a developer does pick one of these, the path to creating a valid and cached AMP page is not as simple as starting and then writing some code and having a valid page that is cached. There are multiple roadblocks on the path to creating a valid and cached AMP page. You may want to do something that AMP doesn't have a component for. You have to stitch sessions from cache to origin 
to ensure that there's proper attribution when moving from one to the other. Then there's that pesky Google branded URL from any Google navigations. It's also hard to optimize your pages and it's difficult to do A-B testing on AMP pages. This is a long-winded way of saying that developers find that AMP's added overhead actually outweighs its benefits, which is why we want to invest in allowing developers more flexibility in how they create AMP experiences. A large problem that site owners have with AMP is that users perceive their content as being tied to Google due to the google.com slash site URLs when they're navigating from Google. However, in April 2019, we launched AMP signed exchanges which allow you to retain your own owned and operated content while still benefiting from being loaded incredibly fast. You can do this using AMP Packager and you can learn more about it at go.amp.dev slash AMP dash Packager. Now, another problem that we've heard from developers is that while AMP caches do add speed, they add development complexity as well. And in some cases, businesses might want to opt out of being served from an AMP cache for any business specific reason. And in that case, we're currently working on a path where developers can opt out of being served from AMP caches, much like Google or Bing's. Now, I would caveat this by saying that in this case, we encourage developers to think about signing up for a CDN to still get the performance benefits of being cached. Now, there's another common misnomer, which is that when a business is thinking about investing in AMP, they're having to give up their preferred CMS or their preferred framework. However, it's quite the opposite. Like any other framework or library, you have to put an initial investment into integrating AMP into your current development workflow. Most frameworks and CMSs like Next.js, Eleven-T, or WordPress have actually developed great first-party integration with AMP, and this makes everything that much easier. Now, while other frameworks don't have that same fidelity, this is something we're definitely looking into, so do reach out to us. And if you want to learn more about the AMP plugin for WordPress, you can watch Alberto's talk about it later. Now, the biggest concern that publishers have is that AMP's performance constraints doesn't allow them to monetize as aggressively. And reasonably so. How to invest in the web is often a conversation between revenue teams and web development teams. And this is why in April 2019, we announced that we're kickstarting a project called Bento AMP a project that allows you to take AMP components and use them in otherwise non-AMP pages. This means that instead of having the traditional notion of a valid AMP page, you can now invest in AMP as you see fit. Your technical team could experiment with a few AMP components and test how that performs and how users respond. They can then slowly ramp up their investment to be a largely AMP page, where there are a few non-AMP components such as monetization or personalization. Or you could think that AMP is a great fit for you and invest in making your site perfectly valid AMP. Bento AMP provides a gradual upgrade path to a fully valid use of AMP. And if you don't want a fully valid AMP page, that's okay too. You can stop where you feel you have reached your goals. Now I'm sure that you're all dying to hear about how the Bento AMP project has been going so far. And I know that Dima has some updates to share in that area as well. Thanks, Nana. Hi, everyone. My name is Dima. I'm a software engineer at Google. I've been an AMP contributor since the project's beginning, and now I'm a member of the AMP Technical Steering Committee. Here is how we prioritize our work on Bento. AMP has been historically fairly static. So first, we are making all AMP web components fully mutable. This means that changing an attribute or a child in DOM will always be correctly reflected. This would enable AMP web components to be used with other frameworks right away uh, using standard DOM APIs. Second, we are re-architecting AMP runtime to work correctly on non-valid AMP pages. This mainly involves removing some of the initial assumptions of a page's structure and optimizing for mutability. Third, we will enable AMP web components to operate without AMP runtime at all. And finally, we are also planning to publish AMP web components to be used in React and Preact apps. And here is where we are at this time. We designed and built the architecture to turn Preact components into web components and to integrate them with AMP. This technology maps DOM structures of a web component to an embedded Preact component that 
implements all UI and logic. This architecture is mutable by design. Further, our UI team has used this bridge to rebuild several AMP elements. We started with a simpler but diverse set of AMP elements, and since then we moved to more sophisticated composable components. We added modern tools such as Storybook to demonstrate and test both Preact and Web components. And we have been steadily reducing dependencies between AMP elements and the AMP runtime. Let's take a look at what's next on our roadmap. First, we will migrate more components to Benta. As the framework matures, we will start migrating more aggressively. Second, once we have a more complete set of supported components, we will launch the initial library of Bento web components that work on pages with AMP runtime included, whether or not those pages are valid AMP pages. Next, we will enable Bento web components to run without AMP runtime. Finally, we will publish React and Preact component libraries for independent use once we are confident in our public API surface and distribution strategies. Thank you, and back to you, Nana. Thanks for sharing an update there, Dima. Now, based on all of the information we've shared with you, what does adopting AMP actually look like? Now, you can start off by testing AMP out by using a few AMP components. And then if AMP first excites you, you can actually invest in making sure that all your third-party JavaScript is only in AMP script, and this gets you to a valid AMP page. And if you want your AMP page to be cached as well, great, you can do so. And if not, just make sure that you're still giving your users a great page experience by using the CDN as well as an AMP optimizer. And that's roughly it, our roadmap for 2021 and beyond. We want to invest in a more flexible AMP approach that gets you the best of both worlds, page experience optimization and development slash business flexibility. And this means that your technical and your revenue organizations don't have to pick one over the other. And with that, Thank you for joining me to learn more about how we're focusing on making AMP the easiest way for developers to create and then maintain high quality web experiences. Let us know if you have any questions. I'm Nana R92 on Twitter if you wanna chat. And with that, I hope you enjoyed all the content that the AMP project has put together for you. Thank you and stay safe. My name is Varun Rao, and I'm the product manager for Web Stories. Web Stories bring full screen, mobile oriented, immersive content experiences to the open web. Within the framework of familiar patterns, tap to advance, swipe to see the next story. Great web stories are not just visually rich and easy to consume, they have a narrative, they have something to say. And we're seeing web stories adopted by a range of publishers around the world as the medium for a broad range of content, from the topical and deep to the fun, personal, and interesting. Web stories are being adopted by independent creators for their sites via creation platforms and by brands for user engagement and even as immersive landing pages for ads. Great story experiences coming to the open web, and we're making them so much better. We've heard your interest in deeply integrating web stories into your site experiences and are building out a rich open source story player to help you do this. We'll help you craft the right user experience for your stories, ranging from highlighting contributors to an interactive grid or a story carousel. Once users start consuming stories on your site, they'll be able to continue swiping to your other stories and react to them just like any other content on your site. Getting started with the web player is easy. A few lines of code will get you up and running with a rich, swipeable experience. Of course, if you like, you can do a lot more. You can embed the story within an article, customize the immersive consumption experience with your branding, and even personalize what story to show next to your user in real time. Of course, we're making the core story experience itself richer and more interactive with a number of new components. You can integrate interactive quizzes to engage your users and build a sense of community, and even poll them for their opinion on the questions that really matter. You can integrate these polls with your own data backends or choose to use our simple out-of-the-box service.
We're continuing to help you bring stories to life by integrating rich support for 360 images and video. You can direct your users to points of interest or allow them to explore the space on their own. Everything we've discussed is in developer previews or available today, but we've got more in the roadmap. Soon, you'll be able to embed audio from services like SoundCloud or Spotify, allow users to easily browse all your story content, enable your users to interact more deeply with products, and wow them with even richer animations and immersive transitions. Of course, it's vitally important that you're able to monetize web stories in the same appropriate ways that you monetize your other open web content. Today, you can already develop direct deals with specific advertisers to run their ads in your stories and can link out to products via affiliate networks. Soon, we'll launch a rich programmatic ad network that you can tap into that will allow creators of any size to monetize their web stories. And this is just the start of how web stories will work for you. Even if you don't write HTML, there's a rich ecosystem of web story creation tools, platforms, and editors forming to help you tell your story. You can learn more at amp.dev, join our Slack channel and GitHub to connect with us, and sign up to learn more about developer previews and launches at the links below. Thank you for listening. Web stories are a new and modern way for immersive storytelling on the open web. At Google, we are very excited about this new content format established by the AMP project. That's why with our visual editor, we are bringing first-class web story support to WordPress. This free tool allows you to easily create beautiful and engaging stories that follow best practices. In this talk, you will learn all about web stories for WordPress, its benefit for content creators using the platform, and how this new editor fits into the overall web stories ecosystem. I will also give you a sneak peek under the hood of the WordPress plugin and how it is powered by the AMP story format, as well as the various ways it uses the AMP components at hand. Web stories feature all the key characteristics of the story format you might be already familiar with from certain social apps. Stories give you a full screen immersive experience and are usually consumed in portrait mode on your smartphone. When consuming a story, you can typically tap to advance to the next page, or you can swipe to move on to the next story. Since web stories are just regular HTML pages, they can be hosted on your own server, driving traffic to your website and making you money. Under the hood, they are powered by AMP, which means visitors will benefit from consistently fast and user-friendly experiences throughout their journey. Just like for regular web pages, it is important to have the right tools at hand to create web stories. Tools that help you speed up the content creation process and allow you to achieve better results thanks to visual editing and guidance along the way. Many such tools already exist today, such as Make Stories or Newsroom AI. But we felt like there was a missing piece in the ecosystem, something that is not separated from your existing content management system. That's where Web Stories for WordPress comes into play. With this free WordPress plugin, the process for creating beautiful and engaging stories becomes fully integrated with the rest of your website. This gives you as a content creator a holistic approach to storytelling as you can easily create stories and embed them in your pages and blog posts, making them an inherent part of your website. All aspects of the Web Stories WordPress plugin are fully open source, including all the product specifications. That means anyone can use it to learn, contribute, or otherwise modify it. We want to help move the whole ecosystem of story creation tools forward and fully open sourcing everything we do is a great step towards that goal. Without further ado, let's take a look at web stories for WordPress. Once the plugin is installed, there's a new top level admin menu item for web stories. This menu gives you direct access to all your stories, a selection of pre-built templates, and of course the story editor itself. The Web Stories dashboard opens with a list of your most recently created stories. From here, you can also access some settings to change things like the Google Analytics configuration. It is also possible to explore the growing list of templates. This is a selection of pre-built designs that you can use as the foundation for your own story. 
They're all really nicely designed and serve as an inspiration for what's possible with the web stories editor. Each template contains multiple unique pages that you can further customize to your liking. But for this demo, I'm going to open the editor and start from a clean slate. If you are using other visual design tools already, this one will look very familiar to you. Front and center, there's the main workspace area. From the left-hand sidebar, you can choose various content types to add to your story. On the right side, you can customize all the elements and also change some story-wide settings. Now I'm going ahead to create a short story and I'll start by giving it a name. Next, I want to insert some images. This is as easy as clicking on them and then moving them around as you please. You can also change the background color so it blends in nicely with the image. Images and shapes can be resized and positioned very intuitively and adding some nice colors is just as straightforward. And if I get something wrong, I can reorder elements using the layers panel. There's also some helpful guidance for exact alignment of elements. And when I want to add some text, I can choose from hundreds of different fonts to create just the style I want. So you have full access to the whole Google Fonts catalog right within the editor. This can be repeated for the next page, adding an image from the media library and then setting the same background color so it blends in nicely with the page. For adding text, I can also use a quick shortcut to speed up the process. Since I want to use the same styling throughout the story, it's nice to see that the font picker shows my recently used fonts to make my life easier. For my next elements, I'm adding a background color using a handy color picker so they can really stand out. We are actually working on automating many of these aspects, picking suitable colors for you to ensure high contrast. As I continue adding some more content, I realize that the bottom text is quite far down on the page. As indicated by markers around the workspace, anything outside of them is not within the so-called safe zone and might get cropped depending on the viewer's screen size. So that's why I'm going to leave some space here. The third page, I want to be a bit more interactive. I'm starting by adding a full-size background video that will autoplay when tapping through the story. Then I can continue adding text elements using the now already familiar workflow. Finally, using page attachments, I can add a call to action for readers to check out this concert in detail. For this, all I need is a URL that the page attachment will link to. Last but not least, I want to end the story with a way for readers to continue browsing on my site. I want to keep this page in a similar style, so I'll simply duplicate the previous one. I'm replacing the background video with an image using drag and drop. I can even flip it horizontally to better fit my desired style. And thanks to the image masking tool, the picture can be positioned just the way I want. Next, I'm going to update the text accordingly. I'm also relying on the layers panel again as I am adding more content to ensure a correct visual order. Finally, I'm gonna add some linear overlay to make sure the text is better readable. For the call to action link at the end, I can simply enter a URL and the editor will fetch a title and image for it. This will be shown to the viewers when tapping on the link. And with this, I successfully designed my first web story. Now it's time to double check everything before publishing the story. For this, I'm going to check whether all pages are in the order I'd like and whether I filled in all the information I need to make sure my story looks great when sharing. I can also preview the actual story on the front end to see if it looks all right. What you see here is the final output, just like I designed it and 100% valid AMP. All right, I think this is good to go. Let's hit publish. Now, the editor suggests creating a new blog post to share the story more easily with your audience. This is possible thanks to a dedicated blog that allows you to embed any web story right on your site in an interactive way, all powered by the AMP Story Player component. Once published, readers can simply tap through the story without leaving the website if they don't want to. As you can see, the Web Stories editor makes it easy and fun to produce visually stunning stories and guides you towards a beautiful end result. These are actually the three principles we build against to help you become as successful as possible with web stories. Now that we've experienced the story editor's power firsthand, let's take a look at how it integrates with the rest of the WordPress platform. To make web stories a natural part of your website, 
it is very important to be able to fully leverage and benefit from the WordPress ecosystem with its thousands of themes, plugins, and blocks. That's why we strive for strong integrations with some of the most used WordPress plugins out there. For example, Web Stories works seamlessly with SiteKit to enable Google Analytics for Stories, requiring zero configuration. While we already ensure stories look great on search and when sharing on social media, sometimes you want more control and customize this behavior to your needs using a dedicated plugin. For this reason, popular WordPress plugins like RankMath SEO or Yoast SEO have already implemented Web Stories support. Perhaps most importantly, the Web Stories plugin naturally integrates with the official AMP plugin for WordPress and its underlying library of tools. This is crucial because due to the nature of how WordPress works, other plugins could inadvertently modify the resulting AMP markup. Thankfully, the AMP PHP library provides ways for us to sanitize and strip offending markup. This helps guarantee that no matter how your site is configured, your stories will always be valid AMP and benefit from features like the AMP optimizer and the AMP cache. The WordPress ecosystem is also known for its wide variety of themes, which is why we are looking into how themes can best accommodate the new web stories format. One key aspect for that is Gutenberg, the block-based editor in WordPress. I've shown one example of such a block earlier, which allows you to embed stories. We are going to expand on this by building a whole suite of blocks, enabling you to easily display a list of your latest stories, or perhaps a carousel of your favorite stories anywhere on your website. Combined with the publishing flow of the stories editor, this unlocks a story first approach to content creation in WordPress. With this, I have covered many aspects of the Web Stories WordPress plugin already. I've demonstrated how easy it is to use this new visual editor and how it allows creating beautiful stories either from scratch or based on a template, all while following best practices. And since it runs on WordPress, it integrates seamlessly into the rest of your website, resulting in a cohesive user experience. Plus, it allows you to leverage the power of other WordPress plugins you're already using today. We are working hard on making web stories for WordPress even better and more useful in the future. This includes not only a wider range of templates to choose from, but also features to create richer stories and at the same time reduce your workload by making it even easier to use. Now, I recommend you to go check out the Web Stories WordPress editor yourself in order to experience it firsthand. You can download it from our website or directly install it from within WordPress admin. Of course, we are always looking for ways to improve the product, so if you have any questions or feedback, please send them our way. Also, a quick reminder that everything we build is open source, so if you would like to take a peek at the source code or make some contributions to the project, you can do so on GitHub. I hope you enjoyed this talk and learned more about web stories for WordPress. I'm looking forward to seeing all the amazing stories you create. Thanks for listening. Hello, my name is John Harmer and I'm a product manager at Google. Today, I'm excited to walk you through the latest AMP for email news, but first, I'd like to welcome two special guests. First up is Nirmal from Verizon Media. Thank you, John. Hi, I'm Nirmal Tangaraj from the Verizon Media mail engineering team, powering Yahoo and AOL Mail. We have been working on supporting AMP email within Yahoo and AOL Mail to support dynamic email. It's been an exciting project that touches multiple points in the mail system the mail transfer agent, middle tier APIs, and the user experience layers. The implementation journey has been amazing, and we are looking forward to various ways our users will be able to interact with dynamic emails from their favorite brands. The motivation to join the AMP for Email project was simple, allowing brands to send richer and more engaging emails to our users. This in turn creates a much better user experience and reduces friction. This also enables features and functionality right within the email environment, which are on par with other native web or app experiences. It's a perfect fit with our mission as well, which is to create the best consumer email experience, period. Along the way, we contributed to the AMP open source ecosystem with the Java-based AMP HTML validator framework. 
When we started last year, we were looking for a native Java implementation of the validator library. On finding none, we implemented our own that is closely aligned with the Node.js validator implementation. This framework is a crucial part of the security framework we have built to keep the user experience secure. While a richer and more dynamic email experience is desired, we don't want to provide this at the cost of security. We work closely with the Google AMP dev team for code reviews to integrate this in the AMP dev repository, and we also put in place a publishing pipeline. We are working closely with the AMP for email working group on a regular basis to increase collaboration among email providers, to define standard techniques, to securely render AMP email, and come up with a framework that makes onboarding AMP email senders seamless. These discussions have led us and other email service providers to move forward as a cohesive group, collaborating on a true standard. It truly is a win-win-win situation at the end of the day. Consumers have a much better, more relevant, and truly engaging and actionable experience. Brands can reach our mutual customers in better ways which far exceed the traditional HTML mail canvas. And the mailbox providers benefit from more engaged, happier customers and potentially even less non-relevant mail, which we need to process and store. And finally, we are excited to have launched our AMP support and are looking forward to collaborating even more and push the standard to the next level. If you are interested in working with us or just to send AMP mail, hop on over to developer.verizonmedia.com slash mail. Thank you. Uh, back to John. Thanks, Nirmal. Now I'd like to turn it over to our second special guest, Rachel from Salesforce. Thanks, John. As John said, my name is Rachel Boyles, and I'm on the product marketing team at Salesforce, where I focus on our email and content products in the marketing cloud. At Salesforce, we imagine a future in which every message and touch point is an opportunity for rich web-like experiences. We care about interactivity, and we've invested in developments in our own platforms towards this vision. And now we see AMP as the next step in fulfilling our commitment to it. That is why we are excited to share that early next year, we'll be launching the ability to send AMP emails from the marketing cloud. Think letting customers schedule their next grocery delivery, all from the comforts of their own email inbox, and maybe even one day completing a full transaction. While Gmail and AMP's unique perspective is on the end user, our unique perspective at Salesforce is on the sender. Now our partnership unites those two things and enables marketers and developers to deliver amazing end user experiences. So let's see how that could look. Here we have an email from Northern Trail Outfitters. They have a sale happening and they want to direct customers to their nearest store. If we already know their preferred store, it can be dynamically included, but let's say we don't. That's where the magic of AMP comes in. Now through AMP, customers can type their zip code into the box just like this and the email returns the nearest store location in hours. And that submitted data can also be written to a data table in the marketing cloud and stored for personalization moving forward. Now that's pretty exciting, right? And what about that use case we mentioned earlier, like scheduling from within the email? Let's see what that could look like. Now in this Northern Trail Outfitters example, the customers purchased a new bike online and they need some support with assembling it. They'll receive an email after their purchase that lets them schedule the service for assembly at the store that's most convenient for them and do so, as you guessed it, all from the email. They'll be able to select from the options of days and times that are available. And because AMP is pulling in real-time data, it will only show time slots truly available, much like a web experience. We could talk for hours about the possibility of AMP and Salesforce Marketing Cloud together, but we're going to keep this short. So if you're a marketer or a developer and you want to learn more about how Salesforce can help you bring these experiences to your customers, reach out to your account team or visit the link that you see here. Thanks. Thanks, Nirmal and Rachel. Those are exciting announcements for the ecosystem. Now I'd like to give a quick update on some of the things that have changed with the AMP for email spec since the last time we had an AMP conference. First off, we've added a bunch of new CSS properties so that you can make your emails look and work better. Next up are some improvements to the registration process. Previously, if you wanted to send an email to Gmail and Yahoo and Mail.ru, you had to register with each of us individually. But we've simplified that process, and now we have a central registration form at go.amp.dev slash email dash registration that will help you get started with each email client, as well as any that we add in the future. And we've added tons of delivery partners since last time, including, obviously, Salesforce. 
And if the one you use isn't on the list, reach out to them and ask them to support AMP for email. Often when we talk to them, they tell us they're just waiting for customers to speak up and tell them that they want support. And there are lots of different vendors ready to help you create and test your AMP emails. Now I want to discuss some of the improvements to how we support AMP for email inside of Gmail. To support more interesting interactions and to not have messages fall back to HTML, we've increased the limit on the AMP mime part to 200K. We also support a thing we call hyperclaps. Hyperclaps is simply merging multiple AMP messages sent over time about the same topic into a single message for the user. This is useful for status updates so that the user only sees the latest message and doesn't feel like they're getting spammed by the sender. Also, when your users have entered content into your dynamic message, like filling out a form, but then accidentally navigate away, we give them a warning so that they don't lose the work that they've done. And for senders, we've made it a bit easier to figure out why your messages are not getting rendered as AMP. Just allow list your sending address in Gmail, send the message to yourself, and when you open it, a banner will display with an error if it's falling back to HTML. Most importantly, since the last AMP conference, we launched mobile support for the Gmail client on both iOS and Android. What can I say except you're welcome. Some of our senders have seen really great results with their AMP campaigns. Find Domestic, a consumer credit company, more than doubled their click-through rate, and Equid, an e-commerce shop provider, saw their customers' revenue go up 27% on abandoned cart emails. But AMP for email isn't just for marketers. Where we've really started seeing it shine recently is with productivity use cases. Taking one to three steps of a workflow or something and bringing that into the email, allowing users to take action and move on with their day without ever leaving the email. One great example of this is Google Docs comments emails. When someone comments on a Google Doc, an AMP email is sent to the owner or anyone tagged in that doc. And they can reply to that comment or even resolve it right from inside the email. But Google isn't the only one whose users have been able to benefit from this sort of productivity email. Tune into our next talk to hear from some of our partners who have implemented AMP for email about what their experience was like. Thank you. Hi, my name is John, and in the previous talk, I walked you through the amazing progress that the AMP email format has seen over the past year. In this talk, I'm excited to hand over the virtual stage to four email senders who are seeing great success when they send AMP emails. With that, I'll pass it off to our first speaker, Jason from Guru. Hi, I'm Jason, and I'm the VP of product at Guru. Guru is a collaborative knowledge solution that helps our customers create and share knowledge wherever and whenever they need it. We've been really excited to partner with Google on modernizing how our customers use email. We've always believed that Guru shouldn't be another destination for our customers vying for their attention. The ability to view and manage knowledge across the various applications is paramount to our customers' collaboration and productivity. For many Guru users, their inbox is where work happens. So Guru's browser extension, email add-ons were the first step to ensuring users had the knowledge they needed in their inbox quickly. While these dynamic integrations are impactful, we knew that email notifications were still one aspect of the inbox where we could do better. We know that email is one of the top five work applications where Guru knowledge is most used and assistive. For many of our customers, their inbox is a centralized hub of communication where the ability to access and manage knowledge can greatly streamline their workflow. One such way Guru users manage their knowledge base via email is through email notifications that help users share knowledge, verify its accuracy, and comment on cards. Tens of thousands of these emails are sent each day, and while helpful, there were limitations to their effectiveness. Static emails are helpful for giving a user awareness of a necessary task, but they also require that user to navigate away from their inbox into our web app in order to review knowledge cards and take specific actions, so their workflow is interrupted. We decided to leverage AMP in hopes of alleviating this user friction with the goal of fostering engagement within an email thread and reducing that context switching. AMP's predefined components, documented examples, and testing playgrounds were all development resources that helped us deploy AMP payloads very quickly in our product. The new implementation has resulted in users now being able to interact with these notifications to a much greater extent. Users can now expand and read knowledge cards within their email thread. They can also complete actions such as card verifications and reply to comments. 
emails are now much more stateful and relevant to users. You can see why we're so excited to pilot AMP by looking at these before and after visuals. The latter version is a much more seamless experience for Gmail and for Guru. While our AMP implementation is relatively new, the early results have been really exciting to see. We're already hearing from customers that this has streamlined the team's management of Guru, helped improve the quality of their knowledge, and the use of their knowledge base. After deploying AMP, we've seen a noticeable uptick in email-driven actions, resulting in a 2.5x increase in the number of card comments and a 75% increase in card verification. These are thousands of actions that help teams manage their knowledge base, all without having to ever leave their inbox. Based on these early results, we plan to extend AMP to new notification emails and enable these for additional email clients. AMP has become an important asset in Guru's tool belt for ensuring knowledge lives where you work. We're excited to keep bringing improvements to our customers via the partnership with Google. Thanks for watching and stay tuned for more. Thanks, Jason. Next up is Shifumi, a product manager at Copper. Hi, everyone. My name is Shifumi, and I'm a product manager at Copper. Copper is a CRM and project management solution designed for G Suite users. And I'm here to share our story and success with AMP for email. We're a different type of CRM. It's designed for people whose business relies on relationship building. Copper functions seamlessly in the background while you spend time on what matters people. We enable users to be more productive in their tools of choice, and I've been doing this for a long time. We built the G Suite integration back in 2014. Email is obviously a big part of how organizations communicate, plan, and collaborate. Until this day, email is mostly used as a gateway to other applications where users can take action or complete their task. This is why the idea of dynamic emails intrigued us supercharging the receiver's experience to provide up-to-date information that you can interact with from your inbox. If you walk out of your Gmail, so should your CRM, keeping all your interactions in one place while highlighting some key moments in your inbox using AMP for email. With Copper at the center of business operations, our users collaborate with teams to keep things moving. This happens by keeping track of relationships, opportunities, and projects to ensure you're working on what's most important for the business. Previously, when mentioning or tagging a teammate on a record in Copper, we triggered a static email notification, forcing the user out of their inbox. Instead of receiving a static email notification each time you're tagged, we leverage AMP for email to give users a single dynamic email where they can see relevant information about the opportunity. They can then respond to comments from their teammates, bringing our users the most seamless experience possible wherever they like to work. Users can also share their reaction in our AMP emails because who doesn't like emojis? Our principle was simple. When everything you need is right in your inbox, you can collaborate nimbly and be more productive. Our developers described the documentation as enjoyable because it helped us add rich components without the overhead of figuring out how to make them work in email with basic HTML. The ease of use of lists, inputs, and tooltips accelerated the rate we prototyped our feature, and it saved us a lot of time. We also got a ton of support on Stack Overflow with a response rate in less than 24 hours. Since we launched at the end of May this year, Copper users collectively send on average 10,000 AMP emails every week. We've seen a massive uptake in the comments and reactions features in their inbox. Comments are up by 50% since we launched and reactions are up 50% in the same time period. Of course, some people still love to navigate to Copper to see more details, but we're definitely seeing a lot more engagement that stays inside of G Suite. We're excited to bring more experiences into customers' inbox. Things like task management, suggesting contacts to add to copper, meeting scheduling, opportunity tracking, and surveys. Experiences that always had to exist in copper before, but can now fit into their users day to day. The possibilities are endless. Thanks, Shifumi. Next up is Leo, the CEO of Voxy. Hi, I'm Leo Koster, founder of Voxy. I'm going to show how to run your professional services business in Gmail with Voxy and AMP for email. Voxy is a professional services automation suite on the Google Cloud. It's built on Google Cloud Platform and is deeply integrated with G Suite. 
Voxy is the solution to your tooling spaghetti and fragmented data. We provide a single source of truth for engaging with customers, projects, and employees, from quote to cash. Running successful projects requires collaboration from everybody in each department, management, sales, project delivery, and finance. The faster you go from sending out the quote, deliver project results, and invoice the customer, the faster you get your money and the less time is wasted. Voxy is deeply integrated with G Suite. Sending emails through Gmail, store project documents in Drive, use docs to create quotes and invoices, and sheets for reporting. Now, with AMP for email, it's possible to manage your services business inside Gmail. Voxy supports more than 60 different workflows with multiple calls to action. Before AMP emails, those actions were completed, on average, the next day. Now, with AMP emails, these actions are completed within hours. That is an 80% improvement. To reach at that success was a very pleasant and smooth journey. Our developers and our users love AMP technology. Developers truly enjoy building, engaging emails with personalized content that is securely and dynamically updated every time you open the email. User adoption is 100%. Completing a workflow can be done now without leaving your inbox. That is a huge improvement in user experience. How does it look? Here are some examples of time-critical workflows. The approval of a quote before it's sent to the customer, the approval of a time entry, and a project manager approving a draft invoice. Because of its fast adoption, we expect to send more than 2 million AMP emails in the first year. Thank you for your attention. Goodbye from Voxy. Thanks, Leo. And to close it out, our final speaker is Dimitri, CEO of Stripo. Hi, my name is Dmitry Kudrenko, CEO of Stripo.email, email design platform. We allow building emails of any complexity, including AMP, and exporting them to any sender. Our main goal is to let users build professional emails easily with no technical knowledge. Looking at rapidly growing social networks, chats, and messengers, we could say that email marketing desperately needed real-time content, interactivity, emotional communication, which AMP now makes possible. So we couldn't miss a rebirth of email as heralded by AMP email. That's why we added support of AMP in the editor. However, for marketers, just editor is not enough. Luckily, Striper can be integrated into any sender as white label. And I want to share the experience of our integration with isputnik.com, a marketing automation platform. This gave users the following. First, sending and post campaign analysis. Then, with a weak editor with M blocks. Third, integration with data sources for using dynamic content and forms and fallback compatibility for non ML clients. Having all that, our users have shown a great interest in AMP. In July alone, over a thousand different companies created AMP ML campaign with carousels, feedback forms, and questionnaires in Stripe. Isputnik adds its own tracking pixel in AMP emails and shows analytic reports. This is how we know that over 50% of all recipients see and interact with them. In some cases, the dynamic email improves KPI by five times compared to a regular HTML version. During the first months after Sputnik implemented it, over 40 brands sent more than 3 million AMP emails through the sender. More and more companies now want to use AMP in abandoned cart emails, real-time recommendation emails, or a status update. AMP for email significantly expands the possibilities of email marketing. This gives new model of real-time communication that didn't exist before. This means that the industry will grow and develop. That's it. Thank you from a Stripo team. It's been great to hear about the success so many email senders are seeing with AMP for email. 
If you're an email sender looking to send AMP emails, register at go.amp.dev slash amp-email-register. Thank you.